The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post-procedure, so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're going to screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay they will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, this is just how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the EPOC that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we're about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Mix cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mix dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the Wrap Venous Cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the EasyFlow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova EasyFlow Duo cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, 
and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500. And then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by Perfusionist and for Perfusionist. Create a free account and check us out today. Okay, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us at PerfWeb 31. Happy to have you today. Today's program, of course, is supported by Levanova and Siemens Diagnostics. We want to really thank them for their continued support of our educational endeavors here on PerfWeb. Um, with me today, as you know, you already know, of course. Oh, I'm sorry. I got to go through this first. You leave it? Okay, what else? Before I get started with the introductions, I would like to ask all of you to do me a huge favor. I got to read these, okay? <laughs> If you are watching us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn, please do one of the following. Like, share, follow, or comment. Also, for you YouTubers, please give us the thumbs up, all right? And subscribe to our channel. Click that subscribe button. Also, would you please go to perfusioneducation.com and leave a testimonial. And for those of you who are watching through our internal system, please leave a testimonial. It really helps us a lot. We appreciate that. Uh, if you would like to be on our program as a presenter, you think you have a good, uh, maybe some good research or a good clinical experience, and you'd like to share that with our audience, please uh, join our robust resident faculty and just send us an email at contact at perfusioneducation.com. You can see it there at the bottom of the screen. We will also be using Slido today. We did this last time, okay? And it's, it's new for us and we're sort of working out the kinks, so be a little patient with it. Um, but we're gonna be doing some online polling. So go to slido.com right now, type in where it says the hashtag perfweb31, and we already have a poll that's activated uh, but you're going to have to wait to slide number eight. So we're going to do something a little different today, which is during certain slides of our one of our guest speakers, Mr. Mark Tatum, he is going to be referring to that slide and asking a question. The question on all three of them is the same. What would you do? We've given several choices. So it's multiple choice. Can't get a wrong answer. Click one of those. Well, you could get a wrong answer if you don't do what I would do, but it's always wrong, right? But click one of your answers so that we can review those polls later. But you have to do it fairly quickly because he has three of these. So between slide eight, slide 26, I believe, or no, slide slide eight, slide, what was the other one? I slide 18, 18 and, then and then slide 26. So please be looking for that. Okay, now, oh, when you see this animation, it means the phone lines are open. There you go. 
And now we can get on with the, uh, the better part of this whole thing, and that is the, uh, the introductions. So to my immediate right, of course, we all know Stephanie, uh, Ohio State grad. Ohio State is now ranked number one. I know you're excited. I mean, not anymore, I don't think. Oh, not anymore? <laughs> oh, what happened? Did they lose? I feel like you said that on purpose or something. No, I didn't. Did they really lose? Did they they lose? didn't lose, they just dropped in rankings. Why? They do that all the time. That's just a rip. Okay. Okay. And then, of course, <laughs> next to her is Mr. Mark Tatum. He is the Clinical Director and Clinical Education and Support Director, VP of Clinical Operations for the Angiodynamics AngioVac product. Um, yes. He is a development of an innovative pa patient-centered program and excellence in execution with the use of the AngioVac product. Uh, he is an accomplished clinical director with expertise in development and delivery of patient-centered programs that consistently provide excellent outcomes. He develops and leads highly effective teams to create innovative clinical support solutions, and his background includes strong experience in medical sales and account management. But you're also a nurse. I you're am. a registered nurse with ICU experience and cath lab experience ER. and have actually worked intimately with the patients that you're now treating with this innovative device. That's correct. So I think that's a very, that's probably the most important thing that you don't even have on here. As clinical education and support <laughs> director of the peripheral vascular division of angiodynamics, he manages a staff of 13 very skilled clinicians. I can tell you that, clinical support people. Whenever we've done an angiovac, every single one of the clinical support staff you have, in particular, this one guy, Mike Sabeos, Absolutely number one, <laughs> number one. Oh, Mike, you're in the audience. <laughs> Shout out to him over there. Um, he develops innovative clinical programs in the area of venous thromboembolic disease and angiodynamics as a company is a leader and developer and manufacturer and marketer of innovative proprietary minimally invasive devices used by interventionalists and surgeons. And they have several divisions, vascular access, surgery oncology, and peripheral vascular uh, uh, disease as well. But our focus today Focus of Mark today is going to be the uh, 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 how to manage unwanted intravascular material, and that encompasses a very broad uh, base of things. And then next, in fact, by the way, welcome. Thank you so much for Thank traveling you. all the way here to Magnolia, Texas, to our fabulous studios uh, to do this presentation. It's very important information, I think, for our staff. What do you think of the studio? I love it. It's, uh, it's uh, the last time I was on CNN, it looked just like this. I know. And then on Fox News later, it was, it was very much the same. It's a really cool setup. I know, and we even have a fish tank. I know. I something know, right? that you probably never saw at Fox. Okay? I didn't. I didn't. So we should and be number one to Fox. And then next to Mark is Tammy Sparacino. You all know Tammy from multiple programs. She's a Texas Heart grad. And her and Stephanie both are 20 year plus perfusionists. Tam, both of them have extensive experience uh, in clinical perfusion, and uh, both of them, I think, share the same uh, passion that I do, and I think the same passion, Mark, that you hope for in people that do our business, in that we're looking for innovative solutions that we can bring to the hospitals that's, that we serve those patients also. And we wanna do the right thing by everybody and exposing some of our hospitals to this uh, uh, innovative stuff that's going on, not just your product, but multiple other things. I think Tammy and Stephanie both personify what it is our profession is looking for. So all of you, thank you for being here and welcome to the program. With that said, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. You're going to, you're going to be advancing your slides and then you're going to say next so that it. I can then sl advance your slides. Or are you going to do it yourself? I got, I got it until, until I mess it up, and then you can just uh, you can let me know. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. From. I don't think you'll mess it up. Okay, Mr. Mark Tatum. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joe. Thanks, everybody, for having me on. I really do appreciate the time. Uh, I am going to go over a few things today. Um, as far as disease state ed education, we're just going to kind of do a little bit of review on that, uh, what causes thrombus, what it is that the makeup is, and then what some of the treatment options are for each of these disease states. Um, one of the things that we'll go over shortly after this is we're going to have a, a, an example of both of our cannulae, so one that we have had on the market for the last couple of years, our Generation 2 cannula, uh, and then show you the differences between what it is that we've done to be able to update this for your Generation 3 utilization. So I'll go through this uh, pretty quickly to get through our disease state review. 
I'm going to go ahead and click through a couple of these slides. There is a disclaimer here, and I only bring this up uh, because I'm required to by law. Uh, <laughs> the other reason that I bring it up, though, um, is that in our indication, when we get to this, in our indication, there's actually a space in there that talks about the fact that we are contraindicated for use with severe venous or arterial vascular disease, which seems a bit counterintuitive. But as most of the audience will understand, we have, we're predicated on a venous drainage cannula. Clearly, you wouldn't normally put a venous drainage cannula in a place that has a significant amount of blockage. You wouldn't be able to get it to do its job. So because of our predicate device, that is what's on there. It is an understanding, however, that we are going to be working in areas of undesirable intervascular material or our newer indication, fresher soft thrombi or emboli. Um, so moving on, Joe, I am going to give this to you. Good. Thank okay. you. Just say next. I will just say next. Um, so venous thromboembolic disease is one of the areas that we see utilization of angiovax successfully um, with deep vein thrombosis or VTE. It does list pulmonary embolism on this slide as well, and that's really there mainly as a reminder for what it is that we have done in the past and for what the, de the device was created for. Created by two cardiovascular surgeons uh, for the treatment of PE percutaneously. And once we got it out into a little bit larger market, we found that that's an area that we feel like we really need to take more time to do more development to make a better product before we get there, uh, at least with our experience with our first and second generation cannulae. So next slide. So what, how, do, how is it that we diagnose VTE? Uh, you're one ahead of me, Joe. If I get you to back up one for me, thanks. Oh, yeah. well, then again, maybe I'm one ahead of you. There we go, Virchow's triad. So three areas, I'm sure that you guys remember this uh, from, from years gone by, years of treating patients. You've got vascular wall injury or trauma. You've got circulatory stasis and then a hypercoagulable state. Uh, the big ones that we think of for hypercoagulable state will be factor V Leiden, um, pro, uh, prothrombin 2210, protein C and protein S deficiencies. Those are the ones that are the biggest that you're going to find in there for your hypercoagulable states from a hereditary standpoint. On the, on the other side, of course, you have cancer, chemotherapy, and things like that. Vascular wall injury, that's pretty self-explanatory. I'm just going to let that one go. Um, and then circulatory stasis. You can think of your patients after surgery, after bariatric surgery, after some of the others, where they're just laying flat for a long period of time. Perhaps their anticoagulation isn't as effective as they'd hoped it would be. Um, you end up with a potential problem for the creation of, of venous thromboembolic disease. Next slide, please. So we're going to diagnose this with, with relatively standard uh, procedures, right? Ultrasound, blood tests, things like this. Um, the blood test that we're going to use likely is going to be a nonspecific test like a D-dimer or something like that to determine whether or not they've got a clotting process going on. Um, and you guys, of course, will be seeing all of these things as we move forward through the, through the process. Next slide, please. So early treatment and early diagnosis is one of the things that you really want to do with these patients. And when you think of venous thromboembolic disease and you think about the patients who you may see with this, um, it's one thing to get somebody who's my age, Joe's age, up where they've had a significant amount of issue with clotting over the years. And just to kind of review really quickly, once you develop a clot in a vessel, in a, in a vein specifically, what you're trying to do is you're trying to relieve that thrombus from that area early so that you can preserve valvular function. It is the malfunction of the valves through distension, through fresh clot process, through uh, clot formation becoming more chronic um, that prevents the valves from becoming effective. So what we want to do is we want to treat those early. So if somebody like Joe or myself comes in where we've been abusing our bodies for more than 50 years, at least in my case, I'm not going to speak for Joe, uh, we may not have as big of an effect on, on this at least in the long term, uh, the long term sequelae. But in the short term, if you're looking for, uh, for, for relief, we can provide that relief. In those patients that are younger, where you discover early on that they've presented with things like swelling and warm legs and, and redness and things like that, we have an opportunity to be able to really have a, a long term changing effect by evacuating that thrombus before it has a chance to be able to set in. I do want to mention just a couple of other things. IVC filters. Um, Something that is becoming less and less in vogue in this country. Uh, in 20, 2014, there were roughly 250,000 IVC filters placed in the United States. Wow. Um, if you compare that to Europe and others, they placed about 9,000 in that same time period. Now, wow. there is going to be a difference in population. There's some other things that affect that number clearly, but they also are a little bit um, less 
aggressive with their utilization of, of IBC filtration. That's and a pretty big spread, 250 to 9,000. It's a big spread. And one of the problems that we have in, in here is that when interventional radiology is the one who are putting these in, oftentimes they don't own the patient. So we lose our patients to follow up, which causes them to stay longer and can further propagate the issue. Mm -hmm. I won't hit these any longer because we do have a few more slides to get through. And I love death by PowerPoint just as much as anyone else. Take Next slide, please. All right, so this is the first uh, setup slide that we're going to have for your ability to be able to, to log in and, uh, and, and register what you think ought to be done for this particular patient. So right ileo cable thrombus extending to the renals. We're going to have an image of this shortly. It's a 65-year-old male with a history of bladder cancer, uh, cystectomy and reconstruction, thrombus noted on the follow-up CT scan. I'll let you guys read the rest of this. I love it when people read to me as well. Mm -hmm. So if we can go to the next slide while we do this okay. shortly, I just want to give them a chance to read. Okay. What was the last thing, a small PFO? Mm -hmm. Let's go back. A uh, small back. PFO yeah. present on TEE. Let's just cover. That's okay. a great question. Okay. So why would anybody be, here's, here would be something great if you've got a free text ability to be able to put this in on the, uh, on the answer, but why would anybody they care? Do. Well, why would anybody care then? Mm -hmm. And we can actually cover this in the post discussion if that'd be okay with you. That'd be great. Absolutely. I think so. Yes. Absolutely. Take so, a note of that. So would. let's come back to this and we'll do the small PFO. We're talking about somebody who's got IBC, IBC issues. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to talk about there's a PFO present. Mm -hmm. Why should someone care? Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to leave that pearl. Mm -hmm. That was a great question. Thanks for bringing mm -hmm. that up, Steph. Uh, I'll leave that pearl and we'll go ahead to the next. Okay. So in this now go to Slido. And this is where it's an active poll right now. So, and let's give one more. Let's give one Mark, more click. Take it away. One more click. And let's give one more click, and this will show us is. the actual live image. So this is that patient. This is what we were looking at before. And what we can see is is that we've got venography here. It looks like likely digital subtraction. So you've got that in the background where you can really, really see the contrast to go through. And then the area. I'm without a pointer, but I think pretty much everybody's going to be able to determine the area that is not smooth and clean and normal filling with contrast, and that would be the area of clot that we're mm -hmm. looking at in this patient. So I believe that on your, on your questions that you have that you, can, that you can answer, it's going to ask you, what would you do? And what would you do? Would you put this patient on lytics? If so, what are the potential complications of doing so? Not only relative to the lytics, but relative to the, to the disease process that you're seeing here. Would you do heparin or low molecular weight heparin? Would you try to do this open? Is there a percutaneous option? I'm going to love to see what, these, what the things are and what the discussion is after we get through this. But in the interest of time, and I don't know how much I have left, uh, let's Plenty. continue forward. Plenty. You're, you're, don't, Do don't, I really? don't rush. Yes. Take your time. Right, you're not in a hurry. So in the, but still, let's, let's move forward and show what mm -hmm. we did in this case. So, so we're going to go to the next slide, please. Okay. So general anesthesia. Most of the cases that we do are done under general anesthesia. Not all. Um, it is our recommendation for any of those cases that are going to happen in the IVC space, those, typ those typically are, are our longer cases. Uh, if you were to look at cases that happen in the cable atrial space through to the pulmonic valve, those cases normally stick, uh, to, stick to stitch are about an hour to an hour and 10 minutes. And the average pump time on those is roughly four minutes. If you flip over to these cases, your, I, uh, your IVC cases, these last much, much longer mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. What's the makeup of the clot? How long has it been there? Is there the presence of an IVC filter? Uh, how far up does it extend? Do you have areas to get access? There are just so many more things that come into play with our IVC cases. So with this one, uh, an 18 French reinfusion cannula, I will say that the reinfusion cannula we recommend to be used is a, uh, an arterial reinfusion cannula, shorter, good for percutaneous access, relatively good for percutaneous access, um, to be placed over a stiff wire. And it works very, very well for us to be able to gather, get our flow rates, which our goal is between three and five liters per minute. Now, I do want to take just a couple of seconds in this space as well. So uh, the minimum size that we recommend, actually that we were tested with, is 14 French, but the minimum that we see utilized in the field today is a 16 French cannula, and that's really as small as we'd like to go where patients will tolerate it. Um, the reasons are fairly obvious, flow rates. Um, also, um, the 26 French gore dry seal. That sheath is a significant, uh, it was, I mean, 26 French, obviously it's very large, mm -hmm. but also its obturator or its um, dilator is very, very stiff. 
So if you happen to be in a case and you can be the extra set of eyes until one of our guys is either there or is working with perhaps with someone else, these all need to go in over a super stiff wire. Uh, the tendency of the wire, a softer wire like a Benson or Rosen, something that doesn't have much body, um, the dilator could actually prolapse that wire and cause you to track right outside the vessel, an extravascular presentation of the, of the sheath. So Amplat Super stiff, stiff or a Lundquist wire, fantastic for utilization for these cases. I am going to mention the last thing. Everybody's had plenty of time to read this setup. Um, the IVIS showed completely clear. So intravascular ultrasound is one of the things that we find used in these cases sometimes. Personally, I'm a huge fan. Uh, less contrast is better. Uh, less rads are better, so less gray is better. So you have the option to view live in real time exactly what the effect of your treatment strategy is going to be in the utilization of IVIS. And you don't sacrifice renal function or um, the exposure to significant amounts of radiation under fluoro whenever you're, when you're able to use that. So let's go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. This next slide, which I think I advanced one further, there we go. So I believe that yours is a little bit different than mine. Let's go ahead and run that. So you can see here on our post image, I think I have an older copy. On our post image, 100%, almost 100% of the thrombus is gone. You can see a couple of areas where you've got a little bit of different filling, but part of that is likely because you do have inflow from the left uh, common iliac that's, that's changing a little bit of that uh, presentation there at the segment where, at the confluence where it meets the IVC. So if we can go to the next slide, you should be able to see exactly oh. what the material is wow. we're able to take out. Wow. Now, this is worth mentioning. Um, in our indication, it clearly says that we are indicated for the removal of fresh or soft thrombi or emboli in vessels, well, and then added on to that, not in the IFU, is in vessels including but not limited to the SVC, IVC, the iliofemoral system, and the RA. We're considered to be on label for utilization anywhere from in the venous system from basically where the cannula will get, which is about the level of the inguinal ligament, up to the SVC, and then in and through to the pulmonic valve. All of those are considered to be on label. So, but this is clearly not fresh or soft. There is a significant amount of chronic thrombus that's sitting in this space. So, because our goal is to find and treat uh, fresh or soft thrombi or emboli, we can do that. But some of the imaging modalities are not really going to tell us whether or not what we have is fresh or has a chronic component to it. Fortunately, many of the cases that we've done to date have shown this, and we've gotten a great result out of these, got not only the fresh thrombus, but also right. some of the material comes in that has a much more chronic presentation. Um, one of the options that I believe that you guys had in your poll was should you use lytic therapy, and we may have talked about that for just a second. We'll go back to this whenever we do it during the discussion and talk about lytics in this presentation and what we think may have happened. All right. Next slide. So now we move on to a new disease process. If I can get you to click again, Joe, it's going to drop a couple of notes. Perfect. So infective endocarditis. You guys know that by the name, this is literally um, an infection of the endocardium. Um, the, ma the majority of these, uh, there are roughly about 15,000 cases of infective endocarditis, new ones diagnosed in the United States every year. Um, and it's most likely been associated with advanced age plus other medical procedures and or um, pacer lead long standing line presentations. You guys have all seen the news and you know that what we're looking at now is an opioid ec epidemic and to have those uh, infective endocarditis IVDA infective endocarditis patients show up is something that we're seeing more and more, not only here, but also here in Canada and in Europe, which are the three places that we have the majority of our utilization of Anjuvac today. Um, the most common organism that you're going to find for this is Staph aureus, uh, is, is the causative agent. And the goal of therapy is the same, right? If you, if, if you, once you identify this, it oftentimes doesn't just happen on one valve. It's happening all throughout the heart. Tricuspid valve, interestingly, is involved quite a bit of the time. And the formation actually begins at the leaflets where they close first and then work their way back as the, as the disease progresses. Now, uh, if we can move forward one also. And one more time, please. Great. So... Clearly, the reason that we want to be able to treat this and to figure this out is because of this embolic events. Now, 
we're not saying that if you treat this disease process using angiovac as an example, mm -hmm. that we're going to change the course of treatment as far as antibiotics are concerned. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to make a claim today that we want you to treat for less time or with a different antibiotic. We still want you to do blood cultures before you get started. Uh, we want you to know what, it, what organism you think it is that you're treating. Uh, get them on antibiotics and see what we can do to be able to relieve the sepsis. And there are other benchmarks that we look at, not the least of which being the size of the vegetation that's there. HRS 2017 says that two centimeters or greater is when we should begin to address this problem. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the imaging portion of this as well. So the mortality is the thing that we really do want to address. A lot of times, you know, we, we kind of joke around with what we're going to do when we talk about infective endocarditis. I don't want to say we joke around, but we talk about removing of things that have material on them. It's the embolization of that material that causes long-term problems, anything from septic pulmonary emboli to pulmonary abscess. And if we could avoid that, and more importantly, avoid the estimated, as we show up on the slide now, 15 to 20 percent mortality rate, uh, as high as 30 percent in some cases, if we could cut that mortality rate by 50 percent, based on the fact that we can help to remove the material, we can make your antibiotics more effective, which we'll cover shortly, um, maybe even change the scope of antibiotics that you're given based on a blood culture. We've seen some of this as well. If we can have that kind of an effect, that is our goal. We want to reduce mortality rate in this space. And for this particular population, uh, I think we can have a, a huge impact, mm -hmm. a huge impact on Very these guys. Very interesting stuff. All right, so uh, we'll continue on. So treatments today, antibiotic therapy. And go ahead and give me another click there. Perfect. So many of the cases that are done today are managed with this, with, uh, with antibiotic therapy alone. If their sepsis is getting better, if their vegetations on echo or whatever imaging they're using are shrinking while they're using antibiotic therapy, we're not asking that anybody go and try to utilize Angiovac or another product to be able to remove that material. It's when these things fail that we would like to see, that, that we want to provide you with an option other than open to be able to treat these patients. Let's go to the next slide. So one more click, perfect. Uh, 40 to 45% of the patients undergo surgery. And early surgery can, should be considered with the following, and you guys can read that list. Um, you know, when you look at, at again, at the, at the Rhythm Society and what their recommendations are when they talk about and I, actually, I want to I want to hold off on a little bit of these things until we get to the CIED. Um, so some of the uh, bugs that you're going to be treating are a little bit worse, obviously, than others. But one of the things that is uh, that is impressive, and let's go to the let's go to the next slide. I just want people to be able to read this one, and then let's move on. Here we go. Endocardial injury, perfect. Mm -hmm. Sterile thrombus formation. Let's stop right there. So. If we're approved for fresher th soft thrombi or emboli, how can I possibly be up here talking about uh, vegetation? And the reason is because of this sterile thrombus formation. When vegetations begin, as you guys likely know, they start out as a nidus of platelets and fibrin, which is the base makeup of clot in the venous system. Having the ability to be able to consider this on label and really everything up to the pulmonic valve to be considered on label allows us to be able to treat this uh, this in an on-label fashion so that we don't have the same constraints and the same issues that you may do when somebody's trying to use a device outside the scope of the indication. Mm -hmm. Next click, please. Uh, bacteria with the bloodstream uh, seed the thrombus. So that's basically the next step in this whole thing is that once the bacteria starts to attach, they've got a place to attach. And if we click forward one more time, I believe you're going to see the image to this right change to what it is that we actually see inside the body once you open it up. This is not an innocuous process. Uh, next slide, please. This vegetation that's on there, let's go ahead and click again. The vegetation that is on there causes damage to the valve as well. So it isn't just sitting there like you might see, um, oh, some a little bit more commercialization kind of, kind of show. Mm -hmm. The incidence is an example. The Angiovac cannula was used in a short series of patients done at a university in the U.S. And the physician who did this study of 40 some odd patients was able to treat successfully using Angiovac as the treatment modality to be able to remove or debulk the vegetation. But in 45% of the patients, 
the tricuspid vegetation, uh, tricuspid regurgitation was worse after the angiovac case than it was before. Mm -hmm. A big question that we had around this, because one of the most common questions we get is, are we going to damage the valve? And it's a great question. The leaflet itself. The leaflet itself, indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and it's a great question. With a circle, uh, the 14 millimeter circle that we have at the end, the funnel opening, uh, it doesn't engage all of the tissue at one time to be able to cause damage. Second, even when you're throwing it flowing at three to five liters per minute, the negative pressure on the outside of the cannula is roughly 30 to 40 millimeters per mercury negative. Mm -hmm. It isn't until you actually occlude the cannula that you get the really high negative pressures that can remove the material in the first place. Mm -hmm. So damage to the valve as a result of the utilization of the cannula isn't what we see. Now, the example that I'm going to give is kind of disgusting, but I'll give it anyway. And if you think of the vegetation being there and removing the vegetation, be kind of like removing a scab. I know that's gross, but mm -hmm. really you're just unroofing perforations that were caused by the growth of this infectious process right. Right, right. on the valve in the first that's place. That's why you have the insufficiency. Mm -hmm. Which is the worsen, which is, accounts for the worsened TR. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at infectious, you know, I mean, in wounds, we've all had them, you know, of some sort, especially you've seen staph wounds in the hospital. Um, at how it just eats the tissue. Mm -hmm. And so it's gonna do the same thing with the leaflet. Absolutely. You know, it's a very hostile environment. Yes, sir. And part of the, and part of the other thing is that it, we're, we're sending antibiotics to be able to treat this area, a tricuspid valve, which is radically ineffective. And part of the reason that it's ineffective is because of the makeup of the valve itself. There's not a large blood supply. So the blood, the antibiotics that are, you're giving are washing by as They're opposed passing to- Passing by. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. As opposed mm -hmm. to innervating the, the material that we're trying to treat in the first place. So what we see with angiovac is, is that in addition to having this grow, you also have a film on the outside called a biofilm. And that biofilm serves as a protection from the antibiotics that are going by. Yeah. Not Using, to mention the leaflet doesn't have, a, it's not highly vascular. Exactly, right. exactly. Yeah. So if we can debulk, disrupt the biofilm, mm -hmm. take a large portion of that out, mm -hmm. we see a couple of things. One, we see in some cases, and this is case specific, not a claim of the device, mm -hmm. but case specific, we've seen patients who are septic on pressors, intubated within 24 hours, relief of off pressors, extubated with significant relief of their sepsis, right? Their, the pressors are gone, they're all extubated, they're significant release, uh, a relief. Of the, uh, of, of the sepsis, and we see that in some cases. There are other cases where actually in the short period of time afterward that the sepsis has actually worsened for a period of time before it got better. Mm -hmm. So we do see both, um, but it is more frequent that we see a resolution faster than it is a worsening of the sepsis prior to resolution. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing I do want to mention, and it has to do with infect infectious disease. One of the questions that we, can, that we get quite often, especially when we're talking about involving ID, is, is how is this going to change my practice, mm -hmm. right? If, mm -hmm. if we're gonna engage them, they wanna know why does this make any difference to them? And in some cases, we have taken the material, we capture it in a filter, we then send that material to the lab, mm -hmm. and then the lab does their culture directly on the material as opposed to the blood, and we have had instances where they grow out between one and four different mm -hmm types of organisms that were found in their blood, in the uh, blood culture, blood cultures. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. No problem. In the blood cultures. So it really did change the, the practice of the person who was an ID. Absolutely. They were treating Staph aureus, which they found, and they found four oral flora under the biofilm and the mm -hmm. actual material completely changed their, uh, mm -hmm. their scope and what it but is that they wanted to do. But it in itself. I mean, you're, you're reducing uh, the, uh, you're greatly reducing the um, the uh, 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 risk of embolization. Exactly. So it's just on its own merit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it would change. your your you're improving the potential survival of your patient just by this alone. Yes, sir. From embolization. Yeah. That's what and we're looking. And all the other bad things you talked about with pulmonary uh, 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 infection. You know, having an embolus there and then getting a, a a roaring infection in your lung. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So if we can go to next, great. Now this is another one where you're going to have your live poll. And oh I think yes, there's, I think they're setting that up. So now. that's right. No, right. So take down the first poll. So everybody that's watching, now go to Slido. Still under PerfWeb 31. The new the new live poll will be ref referencing this these next few slides. So let's take the one down and activate that one. All right. So while they're getting that running. 
tricuspid vegetation measuring two to three centimeters. I do want to mention really quickly, we talked a little bit about what the Heart Rhythm Society or HRS recommendation is for removal. And what they say is two centimeters or greater, you should consider removal of the actual material. It has, um, if you look at our imaging modalities that you're going to find that things that happen at the SVC or really the caval atrial space and through to the pulmonic valve, we oftentimes, we recommend and we would like to see TEE imagery. Now, sometimes we'll get a TTE -T -T -E image, sometimes TEE -E image. The difference is this. With a TTE image, you have about a 70% specificity to the, si to the presence of material, but your, pre your specificity to size is only roughly 30%. If you take it to TEE, the presence of material increases, uh, the detection of presence of material increases to 100%, but still, the appreciation of size is only at that 70 to 80 percent mark, and that is dependent upon the skill of the practitioner doing the TEE. Mm -hmm. So, what we, um, when you talk about whether or not these are good candidates, and you talk about the size of the vegetation that we're looking at, it's very, very important that we find a way to be able to get the best view in multi-planes that we possibly can so that we can appreciate what's, what it is that we're actually going after. There's a paper that I would be glad to find and present, get to Joe so that he can give it to anybody who's interested, that actually asks the question as to whether or not we should be doing this at 10 millimeters or one centimeter. And I don't know what the basis behind that is, whether or not it's because of the underappreciation or whether or not the presence is bad in and of itself. When you mm -hmm. look at, at pacer lead infections, I mean, the recommendation, again, with HRS 2017 is 100% removal of all the device hardware and leads within three days of the identification of the infection and leaving it in past a week or two weeks, I can't remember right now which one it was, increases your mortality rate significantly. It actually has a class 1B recommendation for removing it all. Uh, now, it is a non-randomized recommendation. I do want to point that out, and that can be um, significant. But it's why it's 1B. That's exactly right. It's a 1B and R. So um, pretty impressive the, what Still, it is that you, you could. Know, I think anecdotal evidence is sometimes a whole lot stronger. Um, you know, we know. You bet. But we'll right. talk about that. So absolutely. Um, we'll so go to the next one. We got it. Yes, history of IBDA presence uh, not re not responding to antibiotics with fever. Again, clinical presentation trumps all. We don't just treat just like you were taught, you guys and all of us. You don't just treat the monitor; you treat the patient. We take not only what it is that we see on an image, but what their clinical presentation is and how they're progressing into consideration. So let's go to the next slide. And interestingly enough, it says, "What would you do?" Hopefully, what we've given you, you enough do? time. <laughs> Hopefully, we've given you enough time to be able to answer the what would you do question. Um, and so with that, we're going to go ahead and go to the next slide. As you would expect, a 26 French Gore dry seal sheath. Anytime these cases are being done, if you've got something that's happening in the RA, uh, tricuspid valve, RV pulmonic valve, it's practitioner's choice, dealer's choice on which approach they want to use. With our new 180 degree configuration that you see there on the screen to the left side, um, you can actually really effectively get the entire annulus of the tricuspid valve from either an IJ or a femoral approach. Um, in all other cases, if they happen in the SVC, then we like to approach from the femoral up. If it's in the IVC RA junction and down, we like to approach from the IJ. And the reason is because we always want our device to be in a position of embolic protection. That makes Imaging perfectly via, good sense. Excellent. Yeah. Flow rates are 3.4. Again, that's about right where we want to be. Imaging via TEE, again, for all cable atrial space through and to even to the pulmonic valve, we'd like to have TEE present. And then a snare to help remove the vegetation, which I'll be happy to talk about later if you'd like. Next slide, please. So click one more time. This is actually the angiovac during the procedure. So at the top left of the cone, you're going to actually be able to see the cannula come through. You can see it right there. And then as it moves toward the vegetation, next slide, please. This uh, image that you can see, we all know, can you see whether or not if we click one time, whether or not we're going to swirl? Ah, there, there it is. There you go. Yes. So I see the, I see the gradu. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. That's a, that's, a, that's a Louisiana medical term, oh, gradu. 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 Uh, so you can see the material floating around. And this is typically the presentation we're going to find when you have something with the varying levels of chronicity. Obviously, if it's more chronic, it's white. If it's fresher, it's dark. Um, but sometimes it becomes very difficult to see whether or not the material has actually been captured in here. Uh, it's really easy to see when it's white and it spins around like this. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we can talk more later offline or online uh, at the end of the discussion about how to determine once your filter's full and what are some of the cues. But one of the things that you can even see on this image clearly is the swirl of blood within the filter. That is a huge cue. If we're not swirling, we're not flowing. If we're not flowing, we've got to start investigating. So that's kind of where we sit on this. And if we can go one more forward again, please. This is the material we were able to remove. That, yeah. And this see, is all infectious it is. material. It is. And for, um, for the purposes of this, I would like to go back just to uh, a couple of slides. It may be slide 20. 21, that's it. So go ahead and click forward one time and let's see if it'll roll. Now you saw the vegetation that was sitting on yes. the table there. Mm -hmm. The vegetation measured in it up to five centimeters, I think, four and a half centimeters. Mm -hmm. On this image, would you have guessed that you have four and a half centimeters of material? No. 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 This is this illustrates the the point that I was bringing up earlier, which is skill of the practitioner rotating the probe, making sure that they're able to see as much as possible, mm -hmm. makes a huge difference in evaluating what it is that we see. All right, let's go to our next slides, please. Next, excellent, perfect. So one more click, if you would. Help me out. There we go. So cardio cardiovascular device infection. I got the opportunity to be able to talk a little bit about this beforehand. Um, so what I want to do a little bit is just kind of go through the, um, what our goal is, right? Today, whenever you identify material on a, on a pacemaker lead, one of the things they like to do is something that I like to call pull and pray. Pull the lead. Pull and pray. That was an option in the poll. Oh, yeah. In the, yeah. I want to see if somebody I wasn't gonna pull see, and pray. I, wasn't gonna, I was going to let that one go, see if they were paying that's awesome. Uh, yes, pull and pray is one thing. And it's, it, it, when you talk with in, interventional radiology, they'll tell you that the lungs are the world's greatest filter. I've heard that more times than I care to count. Um, but to a certain degree, it's the God's honest truth. You can just send something. If, there, if you have normal PA pressures, et cetera, et cetera, you can send something to the lungs. It'll either dissolve or the patient will do fine. When you look at this material, because it's infectious, we talked a little bit earlier in our tricuspid section about um, embolization of material and the possible for septic pulmonary emboli or for um, a pulmonary abscess. When you do a pull and pray, th the problem is, is that the issue doesn't show up while they're on the table. Mm -hmm. The issue shows up three, six, nine, twelve months later where their mortality rate again is going to show up as high in some papers as 20 to 30 percent. Mm -hmm. If we had a way to be able to remove that material to allow you to extract the lead without while reducing the probability of embolization of material, everybody wins. And that's really what we're out for. It's always patient first. We want to see what we can do to be able to help this mortality rate and help these patients do better. So it, it's worth mentioning also that there's a heck of a lot more of these to do today. Back in the day when our life expectancy was only 65 to 68 and they weren't putting pacemakers in until 65, well, there wasn't a lot of opportunity to be able to have a generator change. And while the infection rate is only 1%, let's go to the next slide really quick. It's only 1%. Let's go ahead and click next. 7 million devices placed annually, 1.4 million leads worldwide. That's a lot, lot, lot of leads. And when you look at our things on the right, they're being placed when they're younger. The populations are living longer, more upgrades and replacements. And the reason that upgrades and replacements are important to mention is because while the infection rate on an initial placement is only about 1%, on reimplantation it goes up to 3 to 5%. Mm -hmm. It's a significant number of people who can be affected by this, and this only speaks to two of the areas. Really, we focused on IVDA, and now we're focusing on um, PACERS, I, uh, cardiac implantable de electronic devices is what we're focusing on. But in addition to this, you also have long-standing dialysis lines, long-standing um, uh, port catheters, long-standing pick lines, things like that, where an option to be able to remove significant amounts of material that can cause a, pul a pulmonary insult that may negatively affect the patient, we have an option for you. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move to our next one. Before you do, yes, I can tell you right now, my mother's 100. She just turned 100. Oh, wow. Wow. She just had her 100th birthday, healthy as could be. And if she had a line in her and somebody told me they were going to pull and pray, and that's the problem, is that the general public is, 
though we have Dr. Google, they're <laughs> really not that well informed. And if you have this infectious lesion on your lead and your doctor says, that's okay, we can just pull this out and the lungs will just catch it, it'll be fine. They don't know any better. No. But I can tell you right now, I'm not gonna have that happen to my mother. I'm not gonna have it happen to me, you know? I wouldn't even let it happen to, to, to you. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Joe. You. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're becoming fast friends. Yeah, yeah right? Yeah. This, is, this is working out well. Um, so, and this actually goes to exactly what you're talking about now. If you look at all-cause in-hospital mortality, device-related infection, up to 4.3% now. I mean, wow. it, it's kind of, it, it's on the rise. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to provide something that in a study-based environment allows us to be able to prove what it is that we think that we're going to be able to do. To Joe's point earlier, anecdotally, we want to, we want to show and prove that what we're doing makes a difference in the long term in the mortality of these patients by making a reduction in that. And we're working on those processes now within our own company to be able to begin that study. Yeah, sure, uh, and the DRE well. with renal insufficiency is so high because you put, them, put these people on all these high-dose antibiotics and you kill what's left of their kidney. They're in full-blown renal failure at that point. Something else. Uh, okay, if we can go to the next slide, we're going to get to our, our final case presentation. So I think they're going to close the poll for the last one. Okay, is this the one we go? Okay, so let's close the, that poll, open up the new poll. So all you guys, if you haven't already voted, we've got to go to the next poll and get on and do it on this one. And uh, it's going to be number three, referencing slide 26 and 27. And it's another, what would you do? Indeed. Thank you, Joe. So, right ventricular lead with vegetation in the RA and on the tricuspid valve. Mm -hmm. On this one, I'd like to know for our case discussion, if you saw this presentation, RV lead vegetation, 70-year-old male, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, coronary artery disease, MI times 4, and an EF of 10%, mm -hmm. presents with sepsis, secondary to RV lead vegetation. If, if you're looking at this, what are you looking at? What are your mm -hmm. concerns? What are your questions that you'd like to have answered before you proceed with any kind of therapy? Um, and be able to get an answer to those things before we move on forward. I would, I would, I mean, is this a, is this a real patient? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> because that 10% EF That's is really a, a big concern. Yeah. I would yeah. say at a 10% EF, um, that's pretty bad. Just for the sake of argument to make me feel a little better, let's make it 20. Okay. 20%. 10%. <laughs> I, I, you know what? You're going to get a by the ICD if you're 10 this, or 20 either way. So this, you knock it right out. Yeah. This, this, yeah, he's, this lead, this lead problem is his, this lead problem is the least of his problems at this point. But let's see. So we did his lead. Um, he's on, uh, okay. Um, presents with sepsis secondary. I'm concerned if you do anything with this guy, you're going to take yes. him over the edge. He's in so trouble. So to. make him 20%. It's not so bad. Oh, oh I know what to do. The thing I'm not allowed to say, because you're here right now, I got to do it at the end of the show. Yeah, right. cover your ears. The thing I'm going to show you later would be a good possible solution to this. But we'll, 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 we'll go on. So, um, so stay tuned in. <laughs> so where were you? So you said one of, the big, one of the big concerns for you is what? Going in, trying to remove it, or even pulling the lead could just tip him over the edge of he's stable and okay to... Uh, full-blown coding and yeah. so and so what's the so that's a great point so what's the major concern there if you don't mind me asking a question I'm putting you on the spot what's the major concern there I mean hemodynamic collapse gonna, yeah die on the table yeah honey yeah. but I mean <laughs> I would say case collapse, case right? yeah, I would say, I would totally say right. general right. anesthesia right. <laughs> I don't think anybody wants to put him to sleep that's a fact so that is uh, so in, in cases like this, and, and, and Joe's going to have the opportunity to be able to talk about all kinds of neat things about pulmonary embolism that I'm going to not talk about. Um, but in cases like that, and one of the things that we look at is we look at how well patients are going to tolerate the hemodynamic kill or the change in sympathetic tone by the induction of anesthesia. And I know that's where you're going with this, and I could not agree more. Um, so when we see patients like this, our team is mindful of the fact that we want to talk about induction with medications that don't block sympathetic tone uh, to help be able to maintain the constriction that you have in the periphery, to be able to maintain the pressures that you're achieving uh, and be able to make that happen. But from a hemodynamic standpoint, when you talk about an angiovac case in general, because we are venovenous, we don't in spaces from the pulmonic valve all the way through, because we're pulling and returning at the same rate, we just don't see change in hemodynamics. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a closed mm -hmm. circuit. It's closed a closed circuit, circuit, closed system, yes. yep. 
Yeah. Now, you will have some mild, you know, mild hemodilutional effect, but mild. Mild, yes. Um, but you could also f do a blood prime and fix that. So, I mean, there's ways around it. There are ways around it. And I'm glad that you brought up the thing about the mild hemodilution. The cannula and circuit, the entire thing primed is roughly 600 to 650 cc's of saline, or your favorite non-dextrose containing product. Uh, the patients do better. The angiovac cannula performs better in patients who are relatively wet. They are intravascularly full. Mm -hmm. We are a flow-mediated device. We have to have flow in order for this thing to work. And in order to do that, to the degree that the patients will tolerate, tolerate it, as much fluid on board as they can maintain inside the vasculature without causing any kind of an issue. Mm -hmm. That's, well, somebody uh, with an EF of 10% well. is going to be very volume yeah. overloaded. They are going to be volume or overloaded. They're not going to sure. be alive. So let's go to the next slide and let's take a look at what it is that we're dealing with. And with any luck, when you click again, you'll get a play. Oh, yeah. I so, see it flopping around there. Yeah. You see that flopping around, right? So what we have, the hyperechoic, the bright white area that's to the middle portion of the screen is going to be your lead. The other, uh, well, schmutz is the super popular and very clinical term that we like to use. The, the material that's sticking to the lead. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can see quite a, some amount of it there. Now, obviously, this is blown up a little bit larger, but if you had to make a size estimate from this, are you going to say this is, what, half a centimeter, maybe, centimeter, using your markers over on the side, knowing that each one of those is a centimeter? What are we um, going to do? Yeah, I think it's hard to tell on a, on a single plane. I'm so glad you said that, Joe. Yeah. So anytime that we're getting images, our clinical team has, has reviewed. We've done well over 4,000 cases to date. Uh, well over 4,000 cases to date, and we review images on every single one of them. Uh, in addition to that, our team, our entire team, shares all those images so that the person who's been here the longest, me, uh, to the person who's been here most recently hired, seven months ago, they get to see all of those cases and see all of the experience and share and get all of our experiences together in order to be able to uh, to make sure that the product that we're getting to you is going to be the best one we possibly can. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So, interestingly what enough, do? what would you do? And Pull and pray. Multiple operation. Uh, man, maybe no. maybe the right answer. One. I don't know. Maybe uh, the wrong answer. Uh, not no, not yeah. the right answer on this one. <laughs> if you I don't pick think full so, and pray, go back and change it. You got time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go to our next slide. So, we talked about the dry seal sheath. We talked about the reinfusion cannula. You can see a 16 was used this time. We talked about 18. We've even used them as high as 20. I do want to take a real quick pause since we're talking about sheaths and cannulas really quickly and talk about the fact that you may find cases where your physician wants to use two 26 French sheaths in this, in this patient, in a patient like this as a matter of fact, or a tricuspid patient, uh, which would allow you to be able to change the direction that you're going to go with your cannula. So mm -hmm. if their initial approach is IJ, uh, if their initial approach is femoral for a septal leaflet, it may not be able to get there as well as it would from an IJ approach, as an example. Mm -hmm. Or an anterior leaflet from the IJ may not get there as well as it would from the femoral approach. Our team, none of us are going to dictate medical practice. What we are going to do is share our best experiences with the physicians in order to be able to allow them to have more information to draw from. But in the event that they're going to choose to go with something that maybe we haven't seen work as often, a 26 French in the neck and a 26 French in the leg, as long as you have a reinfusion cannula that's 20 French or smaller, you can put the angiovac through one, the reinfusion cannula through the other, mm -hmm. and then if it doesn't work, it's really easy to clamp, reverse, and go right back on pump and not lose a significant that's amount a of time. That's a very good, very good, very good idea. So we'll very see that idea. happen in some of these cases. All right, snare technique used to direct towards the vegetation. I am going to say that the snare technique that we used to use uh, was really necessary with our second generation cannula, which we're going to go over with, go over in just a couple of minutes. With our newer third generation cannula, which is out, which you've seen on all of our slides today, um, you can direct that 180 degrees anywhere from about 45 degrees all the way to 180 degrees. As a result, we haven't needed to use those snares in order to be able to direct the distal tip of the cannula mm -hmm. like we used to. Mm -hmm. All right, next slide. I've done please. that snare with Dr. Matoyer. Is that, it's, he did, he did a, I tell you what, he did a great job with it. It, it is. It, it worked. It's it a worked. challenging. It's challenging, but it, he did it and it worked really well. We, did, we presented that case, right? You were there with us, Mike. Yeah. All right, so if we can go to our next slide, you're going to see 
what oh, it was yeah. we were able to capture out That's of there. That's a now, lot bigger than just a couple of centimeters. It is, and you can see it's on it's present on both sides of this. Now, unfortunately, I don't have an image of this being outside of the outside of the filter. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they ended up just boxing up the whole thing and sending this in. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a good another good illustration of what it is that you see on an image may not be indicative of what actually is present within the right atrium Absolutely. or other area. Absolutely. All right. If we can go to the next one, this is going to be the most the brief, uh, a very very brief portion and also will represent the end of this slide deck. So pulmonary embolism, we've got the all, all of the causes that you may have for uh, pulmonary embolism listed on the screen in front of you. That's certainly not an inclusive list, but some of the things that may cause it. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, then let's talk about options. So open surgical embolectomy is a great option. Uh, we work closely with Dr. Andy Kaiser out of uh, Pittsburgh who does a significant number of pulmonary embolism cases. He does them open. The patients do well if they intervene earlier. Uh, and um, he's able to do things from express clot through uh, actual compression of the, uh, of, of the vasculature to clamping across the hilum and doing a reversal of flow with the patient on full deep hypothermic color mm -hmm. of pulmonary mm -hmm. bypass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So he can, actually, uh, he can actually reverse the flow through the pulmonary veins, send all the clot back out through the main PA, capture it, and get a really, really good result. Mm -hmm. Great option for the treatment of pulmonary embolism. Next, it's going to show thrombolytic therapy. There are catheters um, on the market today that are approved for placement within the pulmonary vasculature, mm -hmm. giving <laughs> lytics to a specific area, reduces your chance for major uh, complications from a 1 to 3 percent with catheter directed versus a 10 to 15 percent with systemic. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't have, uh, I don't think as great a worry with some of the relative, not absolute, but relative contraindications that you may have to lytic therapy otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, IV heparin or Lovenox, great for stopping the propagation of further. We all know that heparin and Lovenox don't work to dissolve the clot, but certainly keep it from getting worse. And then oral anticoagulation. I do want to mention also, um, there was a, another physician that we work fairly closely with who, in the beginning, when we were trying to work with angiovac and PE and figure out what we were good at and whether or not we were good in that space, had 10 patients that he came in with varying levels of severity of pulmonary embolism, all of them toward the massive side. All 10 of them, he put CDT in place to drip them overnight with all in conjunction with placing them on ECMO. Totally anecdotal. I don't know. There's not any good inclusion or exclusion criteria. Having said that, uh, 10 out of 10 were still alive at 90 days with a massive presentation, which is pretty impactful. I look forward to seeing and angiodynamics. We are now working on cannulas that will be labeled to work in this space. Um, and I look for that within the next... I'm not going to pigeonhole myself into a time on camera, but it is something that we're working on today and uh, look forward to bringing that as we continue our research with our opinion leaders and our, um, and our focus groups to be able to get something that we can deliver to the pulmonary vasculature safety eff safely, effectively, and have a, uh, a great outcome for this difficult patient population. And if I can go to the next slide, I think it says all that needs to be said. Joe, thank you very, very much. Very, 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 very good. Now, Thanks, guys. Excellent work. Now, do we want to, by the way, 100% of the people said they would use uh, long-term antibiotics on your, uh, on your last, uh, last one. That would be 100% correct. I don't know how many yet. That would be 100% um, correct. What the number is of the people that responded. So we'll get the other ones. If we could, if you can give me just the, res just, you know, don't put, don't put it up. I don't want to put it up. Just give me the numbers. Or where's Magic? <laughs> uh, when he comes in. Just ask him to get the, just, just report the results to me if you could. Um, so do we want to go into a discussion now or do we want to jump right to Dr. Zlotnick? Uh, how much time do we have before Dr. Zlotnick's on? About 11 I, minutes? He's not slated until 3.15. Okay, oh, so okay. we have, we have, have time. plenty have of time. Minutes. So we could just discuss this if you'd like. I'd love to. Um, can, can we, while we're here and have this, uh, this platform, can we go through the differences really quickly just to show you? I would promised you I would show you the differences between the second and third generation. Yes, yes absolutely. We have plenty of time to do that. that would yes, be I would love to do that. That would be fantastic. So for those of you watching at home or in your car 
or wherever you may be at the airport. Um, because, of course, this is the best program. You know one wants to watch fun YouTube videos, right? You want to watch this. Right. This is the best. Right. Um, so, but for those of you, uh, Dr. Zlotnick is going to be coming on and talking about uh, developing a successful angiovac program in your hospital. I believe that is the title. I want to make sure I have the title correct. It's going to be uh, building an angiovac program. So I think that's going to be very important for you to look at. Um, one of the points that I was going to make is that angiovac cases count as a procedure for our ABCP procedure counts each year. So this is a really useful tool that is, in my opinion, still grossly underutilized in the market. And so I think this is something we really need to talk about and perfusionists to get more actively involved. One of the things, Mark, I'm going to ask you for is to help give us guidance on how do we find these patients. You know, we work with heart surgeons. Heart surgeons are going to get the cases if they're referred to them. Yeah. But they're coming somewhere. And given what I understand about geographical utilization differences, if you will, um, something that I find odd to me is that how a population that I see here in Houston can be using this so much less frequently than a place like Indianapolis, which has a much smaller population, mm -hmm. but a much mm -hmm. higher incidence of the use of the angiovac. So I'm trying to figure that out. So just keep the questions in your mind. Okay. But if you want to show us, Jen, what, what slides do you need? Actually, yeah. I don't need a slide. Just uh, the camera would be fine. And then yeah. I just need to step over and just grab a couple please. of the cannula. Yeah, please go ahead yeah. and bring it back here and then just sit here. We'll zoom in. Can we zoom in on the, the catheter? Somebody man the camera for Mike? us. He'll bring it over Gen here. Gen 2 cannula? Gen two yeah, you can. Uh -huh. Perfect. Duck. 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 Duck, Mike. Duck, duck, duck Mike. You were a Marine. I thought you knew how to right. duck. Army. Oh, that's right. You were Army. Army. Oh, that's why. No, you were, Mar <laughs> you were a Marine. No. Wait a minute. All right. I was Army as well. Come on, man. All right. Uh, where are we? Okay, so here, we right? can zoom in on this real good. Mm -hmm. and oh, give, so, yeah, so give us a second and let us get focused you and bet. stuff. So they can do a lot of, uh, a lot of fancy voodoo. Just remember, though, your depth of field may not be as far. You want to come out just a little bit. Just maybe, yeah, zoom out a little bit. That's little a little bit tight. wider. There you go. Perfect. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's good. All right. And then you got a good focus? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Do you fantastic. need a better light on it or are we good? Okay. All right, go ahead. All right. I'm done. Fantastic. No, no, that's great. So this is actually, oh, I don't have my this is rep re representative of actually the fourth generation of the cannula. Yeah. There was a previous version prior to our company buying it. Mm -hmm. And that one was a 25 French outer diameter, a different shaped balloon on the, on the inside of this outer bag. Um, and it's worth mentioning because in some instances we've gone to these cases where the facility wasn't able to get a gore dry seal sheath. And because of that, they feel like they have to cancel the case. And the answer is absolutely not. These cases were done 100% via cut down when we first started, and they're still done via cut down sometimes today. So when, you, when we're looking to be able to do these, if Gore goes on a back order with their dry seal sheath, which just happened a month ago, uh, really? and has been resolved, but wow. it did happen about a month ago, wow. there is another option. One of the options is a Medtronic sheath called a Centrant sheath. It's also 26 French. The negatives of that is the fact that it has a, an opposing um, slit valve. So one is going this way, one is going this way at different depths within the, the body of the sheath. It takes away some of the feedback. Because there's constant drag and an inability to adjust the tension on the cannula, um, there's constant pressure type feedback whenever you're doing these things, which makes it a little bit difficult to uh, get some of that feedback when you're treating a patient. Mm -hmm. You don't want to push through something when you can't tell. From the operator's perspective. From the operator's yeah. perspective, mm -hmm. indeed. So this is our generation two cannula. Can we go back? Yeah, there Here you we go. go. Thanks, ben. So we had radiopaque markers that we added to the distal end. You can see that there's an outer balloon and the inside of here is an inner balloon that actually works to inflate and separate the pedals to create a funnel right there at the end. Now, the more uh, fluid you get in there up to roughly an atmosphere, you one want atmosphere. You want a syringe? No, that's quite all right. I've got I, one right here. This is going to get so much. Actually, you know what? 
Joe's going to do this. We're going to put this cannula on the spot. If I can get you. Now, what, is this a trick syringe? Here, Joe see. gave me a trick syringe. Mm -hmm. No, you just, you, just, you just have to. I think I broke his syringe. At any rate, so we had a balloon no. on the end. We did have up to a 20 degree angle that we see. offered before. Let me see it. I'll give it there. Sorry. And a stainless steel coil reinforced cannula. Now, some of the challenges that we saw, and Joe's going to blow this up with air. I'm going to let Tammy do it. Tammy's going to blow this up okay. with air. Here we go. If it works. Now. Yeah, see, it works. There we go. You can see this starting to go in. Now, normally this is done with an end deflator, and we'll get a lot more in there than what we're able to get out of that little 3cc syringe. But what happens is, is that it would open the pedals. Now, uh, further, I'm just going to go right down the cannula. Stainless steel coil reinforced cannula with a quick connect on the back end. Here is our inflation port where we normally would use an end deflator. And this quick connect allows you to be able to rotate the cannula without having to rotate the entire circuit. Anybody who's been around long enough to have seen our first generation cannula, it's kind of like working with a swan. Anybody who's worked with a swan, mm -hmm. you kind of have to chase them all the way around with all the ports. Uh, we wanted to solve that but with a quick, with a quick connect. Uh, quick connect on the back end. Now let's talk about what we tried to change with the Generation 3 cannula. And the good news is, is that all we changed with Gen 3, other than its location, is everything. So <laughs> you no longer have a balloon on the distal end of the funnel. Are we right here? There we go. We no longer have a balloon on the distal end of the funnel. One of the challenges that we had with some of the cases that were done with our Gen 2 cannula was that as you inflated the balloon, some of the pedals wouldn't, all the way, wouldn't expand all the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This would create an area where a pedal could actually prolapse in, and with it prolapsing in, you would have an effect on flow rates and the ability to be able to extract material. Now, there is a nitinol basket on the inside of here. That funnel is the same every time, and it's and, 14 millimeters. And for people unfamiliar with nitinol, when it gets warm, it expands. And so as that's collapsed in the cool, you put it through the sheet, it gets in the bloodstream and it mm -hmm. opens up. And so the way that it's done here, we've now, instead of a balloon to expand our funnel, we actually have an oversleeve. Let me go back into here, there we go. So you'll actually retract the funnel into the oversleeve. That oversleeve will allow you to place a dilator or an obturator and a wire right on through. Once, that, once you're in position where you wanna be, wire and dilator come out and then a little quick advance of your cannula, and you can see the funnel automatically expanding, same shape every single time. Now, regardless of approach, on the back end, we told you you could approach from either direction, IJ or femoral, and get a very similar, similar performance to the cannula. You can see this TUI on the back end. This allows you to be able to advance the cannula in and through, pull it back, and once you've got the angle you want, you simply lock the blue TUI down, and that'll hold the shape that, it's, that you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. So if I'm coming from the neck, let me get back into camera there. If I'm coming from the neck and I need to have, oh, let's call it about a 75 degree, 80 degree bend, That's we can close. stop it right there and lock that right into place. And now we can treat as an example, and we're gonna talk about tricuspid on this one. We can get the entire annulus of the tricuspid valve by simply rotating your cannula from one single approach mm -hmm. and be able to get all the way around. Very nice, very nice. You mind if I ask what the, what the uh, stopcock's for? The stopcock on the back end here is, uh, it, this is a flush port. So because we now, have, it's a great question by the way, now that we have an oversheath as opposed to a balloon, mm -hmm. um, and I'll go ahead and separate the whole thing out. You wouldn't normally do this, but I'll just separate them out so that you can see that you have two completely separate tubes ah, here. Ah, now I see. So, so this oversheath, if you'd put a sheath into the vascular system anywhere, you'd want the ability to be able to pull a negative, evacuate any air, and then till you get a little bit of blood back, and then give a good flush forward to make sure you have a nice mm -hmm. airless system. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. that's, what the, that's the whole purpose of this. So once this plops back And then back that in, one gets flushed via the circuit itself. That's exactly okay. right. Mm -hmm. Right. So unlike that first, that, that third, that, that second generation, if you will, this is three, your previous generation, that just had the one the one method for flushing was central lumen. Correct. Because it didn't have the oversleeve. Correct. Okay. That's exactly right. Um, so anyway, this is, uh, this is kind of the everything that we've changed. I do want to mention also, while we don't recommend that you ever clamp this, where was my camera? There you go. Where we ever clamp this. Yeah, with wire. Yeah. If you were to clamp it and you were to squeeze this, and I'll see whether or not you can see this, I'll pinch it all the way down. 
It will rebound. Here, zoom in. Yeah, let's, let's get them to zoom in and let them see that. Do you All want right. a tubing clamp? I can give no. you one. No, that's okay. I can do that. that okay. We'll be just fine. All right. Wow. <laughs> it's a scary looking guy on the camera. So just if you would focus on the cannula alone. Uh, I'm going to squeeze this and you can see I can pinch this all the way through and then release and it maintains its oh, yeah. shape. Oh, yeah. If I were to do the same thing with our generation two cannula, sorry Mike, Go ahead. I can fix it though. Uh, if you do the same thing with our generation two cannula, I'll show you fingers here. I'm going to pinch and then when I let go, you can see that it yep. held that nice yep. flat presentation. Yep. Yep. You can fix this. Actually, you do it the same way you'd fix a coronary artery or peripheral artery. You go through with a balloon and you plasty it open. Mm -hmm. So we've done that with a non-compliant 1220, uh, gone through and had to plasty it open if somebody grabbed a little too aggressively with the cannula when they were trying to advance it. So are you still selling these or it's all converted to generation? That is a fantastic question. So we are still manufacturing the Gen 2 cannula today. Uh, we don't have CE mark yet, or we're not approved for utilization for this device in Europe or Canada. So we're still going to be selling these devices, at least in Europe and Canada. And in the event that there's ever, and you know how it is with the medical device world, right? If there's yeah. ever an issue with our ability to be able to manufacture, if there's a back order on any mm -hmm. part or something like that that we can't control, we'll have these as a backup for a short right. period of time. Mm -hmm. Right now, um, we've just completed our limited market release of our Angiovac Gen 3 cannula that I just showed. Um, we've done already almost 60 cases. Um, and there has been one case where it did not perform and remove the material. Uh, this patient had had, prior to us, Lytics, ter um, Ecos, they had What's the cleaner wire? They had the um, Inari clot retriever or flow retriever, mm -hmm. uh, all of which tried to go in and have an effect, none of which did, as so it turned it was out. Too chronic. It was way too chronic. Calcified, the patient had, yeah. well, fibrotic. It was renal cell carcinoma. Oh, so okay. it was well, really, really uh, thick. Yeah, that's yes. bad. Very that's hard bad. material that was, that's uh, a, that's a we huge, weren't able to extract. That's a huge, huge problem. Yes. Huge problem. So that's kind of the differences between the two cannulas. Again, I kind of make a joke out of it, but it is true. The good news is, is that the only change we, ch the only thing we changed is everything. Um, it's very much easier. To, it's so much easier to use, so much easier to set up. And we are seeing, in addition to that ease, fantastic results with our cases. So very excited about, uh, about this product and are already working on our fourth and fifth generations of the Angiovac cannula and circuit. Okay, so let me give you some very interesting, very interesting information. Okay. On question one, 100% said open uh, thrombectomy. Uh, for question for number 18. Wait, Joe, can I stop you? Was, can we get a brief yeah. reminder of what the first Eight was that iliac thrombus. Remember that iliac thrombus in the, in the uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, was 100% was open thrombectomy. Okay. For question two which was the, uh, which was question two? Question two was the tricuspid in The tricuspid, 100 long-term antibiotic therapy. Okay. And on the uh, Which, final, by the way, is the correct answer. Final question? No, it wasn't. It's a correct answer, a but correct it's only a part. A part. Mm -hmm. And it won't do it. What's, would you like to reset poll results? No. Oh, do you need to close the poll? Do we close oh, yeah. the poll on that there. one? Yeah. Uh -oh. yeah. The results. Right no, it won't give it to me. Um, can you can you guys help me out and just tell me what uh, what it's supposed to be? Oh, there it is. Hundred percent is long term antibiotics. The same. I got it. Never mind. I'm sorry. Same thing. Hundred percent. So interesting. So it seems like we have consensus. Well, on the consensus so far, I don't agree the... with the, any of them. <laughs> I think all of you were wrong. But you know, I mean. So, nothing like nothing like complimenting your audience. So, so there's only there's only one that I would consider a little bit outside what we might normally find, and that's the one that says open uh, open interruption for the iliocable thrombus. Mm -hmm. it, it, as open as you might get, likely if they weren't going to use Angiovac, which in this case we clearly did. Um, if you're not going to use that, then likely what they're going to do is they're going to start with a lytic therapy. They're either going to have systemic or probably catheter-directed thrombolysis. They may use Angiojet. They may use clot retriever. They may use flow retriever. There are a multitude of devices that are on the market to treat VTE. And all of them have their place. I mean that. All of them have their place. The benefit, the thing that we like about the utilization of Angiovac is the fact that you get 
the, uh, the estimated blood loss per case is roughly 50 cc's. And that is only as a result of uh, what you have left in the circuit when you finish, because again, you live one-to-one -one reinfuse. The next thing that's a huge benefit is that other products either depend on another product to be able to melt the material that's there, Lytix, or they fragment the material to be able to pull it out. I'll use AngioJet as an example. That fragmentation can cause some significant issues, um, not the least of which can be distillimbalization. So our goal with the large bore and the large funnel is to remove things whole or on block, to mm -hmm. decrease, not, yeah. emol not eliminate, but decrease the probability of embolization of material causing a further problem. Well, mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. case one, don't we want to discuss the small PFO? We do want to discuss this. We PFO. do want to. Okay. Is there so. anybody? Is is there a way to be able to get a live? I'm going to let you guys discuss. Why would we care if there's? A, it's an. It's all the way down here. Mm -hmm. Why does it even say anything about a PFO? We recently had a patient that um, had history of PE DVTs. It moved and it was in the right and left atrium. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes. That's why. I mean, it's that's why you care. It's for us. It's somewhat intuitive. I'm yeah. not sure. I, I, I would hesitate to think that any perfusionist wouldn't know that answer. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's a great point. So, but there's something else that we have to consider. I know that you guys work in this space all the time, and I know that and you're you going to know the answer. said it was a left to right. It was a left to right shot, but it doesn't matter. No, it's a right to left. It's a right to left. It was a right. To, I thought yeah. it said not a right to left no, shot. Can we uh, can we go to that slide? Right can we put his slides one. back up? Go to slide. Here, I'll I don't remember which one. Yeah, just go to slide one. I wrote right to left. But I did too. That's what no. I said. Go to slide. Go to slide one because I, I I'm I'm positive, but we're gonna check. Oh, I'm positive. Oh. I'm, positive. Here. Oh. I'm gonna go. I'm true, flipping true through Lux, it. Here, there. Dinner. Start it back up again. Oh, true Lux dinner. True Lux dinner. True Lux dinner. For us, not just for you. Yeah. Bet. No, That's I get to bet. go to. Wait can, a minute. Is there a true looks taking stone crack? I need to yeah. go back. Oh, yes. oh, we can skip all that Lupe, Lupe. stuff, y'all. <laughs> we can skip Lupe some Lupe. Lupe. I didn't realize there's a true look. Here. <laughs> just, the, just turn them on. I'll flip the eight. Case, it doesn't matter. The first case study. It's slide yeah, just, eight. Just, it's slide eight. It just. Well, that was the photo. Oh, okay. Wait, well, oh, it's right before that. Right before. Right before seven. Okay, hold on. I got it. Small PFO present without right to left shot. True Lux for Joe, <laughs> and a guest. Uh, and a guest. If anyone from the audience calls in, Call asks in. a question, uh, sends a good text question, something, uh, then you time. will be Damn. my guest. Damn. Stephanie gets to pay for me, <laughs> Tammy gets to pay for you. It was Done you deal. first. I thought I'm sure it was going to be me. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh -huh. what do mm -hmm. you consider to be safe? Closing that before you start. <laughs> Closing the shunt? No, yeah. probably not. I would just, I would just make sure that I had. No, you would just want to go superiorly, or put a filter in if you want to go inferiorly, Which and, is and 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 in make sure it gets protected. Anyway. The whole idea is to protect it from getting into the right atrium, because once course. it gets in the right atrium, it starts tumbling around. Even though you don't have a right to left shunt, you still have the possibility that it's going to make its way over there vis a vis the case that you just, just got there doing. it in. Yeah, he yeah. is. <laughs> he is. So, right on. There without you go. the right to, And thank you very much for bringing that back up again. Yeah, yes. So, without the shunt, anytime. So, when we're looking at the imaging and we're talking <laughs> and we're talking about the imaging that we get for these things, we talk about getting a TEE for all cases that happen in the cable atrial space uh, and through to the pulmonic valve. One of the things that we always look at is the location. There are five indicators that we look at when we're looking at right atrial cases in any of these things to be able to determine whether or not they're good cases for angiovac. Location, size, mobility, and being able to determine the mobility from heart wall mobility versus the actual motion of the material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Density, and then the fifth one, which I'll remind you of in just a minute because I really want to get back to the other, and that is location. Anytime that we get an image that shows material moving and we cannot see the intraatrial septum and there's a lack of motion in that space, it's a, that is material that is crossed to PFO until it's proven otherwise. Oh. We, always oh. make that, we always make that assumption. So especially if we're able to see an area of attachment at the intraatrial septum, stuff doesn't grow there. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't. You might get a myxoma. It's on a rare occasion. Mm -hmm. But it, traditionally, things don't grow on the intraatrial septum. So if you see a lack of motion with material that originates for the set from the septum, it is a PFO with material that's crossed until you prove it otherwise with imaging. 
It's a huge, huge point to be able to make. I actually, if I got time for a quick story. Please. I had actually shown mm -hmm. up. So there was a, uh, I live in Little Rock, Arkansas, and one of our practitioners lives in, uh, is out of Memphis, Tennessee. And it's a cardiovascular surgeon, and his name's John Craig. Dr. Craig calls me and he says, Tatum, I got a case. Here's my images. What do you think? And he sent me four TTE images. And I said, John, I can't see the septum and I don't see movement there. Gave him the whole thing. I think it's going to be crossing a PFO. He goes, yeah. I said, can you get a better image? He said, no. I said, well, I love to drive fast. How, how soon will the patient be there? He said, one hour and 30 minutes. Now, it's two hours. I was hitting my mic. I'm sorry if that messed up. It's two hours from my house to Memphis. I made it one hour and, and uh, 18 minutes. It's an hour and 40. I made it an hour and 18. Beat the patient there. Got in, got the patient to the table. We did not open any product because I was fearful that it wasn't going to work out well. Hmm. Uh, he goes over, they drop a TEE probe, and he says, Tatum, get over here. And I walked in, and sure enough, they've got the stuff which originates at the atrial septum, and going right across the septum was a piece that was large enough that you just wouldn't wow. risk embolization. And so wow. we make that assumption for all of the cases that happen wow. where you have a lack of mobility in that space. That, you know, see, and there you go. You know, you didn't really know. And you know what? You could have winged it, so to speak. Now, probably isn't, and you'll be okay. And then you go poking around, and that piece breaks, breaks off, off, and they have a big stroke, and uh, so over. over. It's see? not, it's, it's, we, again, we don't, we don't, uh, give medical judgment, right? We don't, we, don't, we don't dictate medical practice, but what we will do is when somebody asks, do you think this is a good case for angiovac? No, I don't think it's a good case for angiovac. Unless you have a way to be able to, to ensure that you can protect the head vessels, yeah. right coronary artery is gonna be the first one that's gonna go after if it goes to the heart vessels. Mm -hmm. And then what we find usually is that there's a little bit less concern. They feel like they can chase something into the mesentery or another area should it embolize there. They just want it out of where it's existing. Uh, so what? I mean, a gut uh, infarct is pretty it's, bad. It's a gut <laughs> infarct is awful. But they can ease, they can, uh, they feel that they can easier chase a gut infarct than they could chase a cerebral one. Well, clearly. Well, I mean, that's, so yeah, somewhat, yeah. when they well, talk about risk assessment, a, you right, have a little more time. Acceptable risk. Mm -hmm gets them to, and I know that the answer to that is obvious, but acceptable risk is something they're able to take in the mesentery yeah. where they're not able to take it. Other, yeah, other wow, ways. that's that's some scary stuff. Um, what can, oh, what day can we go to Trulux, Joe? That's my question. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, tonight, or any I day. Who is that from? Who, who posted that? Uh, Silent Scope 1032. <laughs> that sounds suspicious. It does. I don't know who Silent Scope is. If you wanna, if you if you wanna reveal your identity, please do. Okay. So, is Doctor uh, Zlotnick ready? He is. He is. Okay. So why don't we bring Doctor Zlotnick in, and I will uh, introduce him if I can. He's sharing his screen right now. We need to see if he can stop sharing his screen so we can see. Mm-hmm. There we go. I know that guy. Okay. <laughs> and there you go. Hey, Dr. Zlotnick, how are you? I'm doing well, guys. How are you doing? Good, doing great. Welcome to our studios. You look a <laughs> oh, little sinister. You look a little sinister mm -hmm. with the shadow on half your face. If you have a little, if you have a, <laughs> another light, be great. I I you <laughs> you <laughs> but you do. You look a little sinister. And then with the deep voice, it's even more sinister. So, yes, Dr. Yeah. Zlotnick, I'm going to introduce him while he uh, uh, gets himself organized there. But he is an interventional cardiologist with UBMD. Uh, is that University of Birmingham? University Where? of Buffalo. 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 Yeah. Buffalo. The Bills are doing good this year. University of Buffalo um, and uh, in cardiovascular medicine with specialized training in echocardiography, nuclear cardiology, and non-invasive vascular interpretation. He sees outpatients through UBMD, ambulatory practice, at the Amherst Clinic. And he cares for patients admitted to, admitted to the Buffalo General, General Medical Center, uh, consultative service, and the uh, Buffalo General Medical Center's cardiac care unit. His interventional practice involves evaluating and caring for patients with coronary and structural heart disease. He performs diagnostic coronary angiography, percutaneous coronary intervention, 
coronary atherectomy. You know, we forgive you. We're perfusionists, so we understand you like to do PCI. That's okay. Eventually, you'll, you'll follow the data and start referring them more for surgery. Coronary atherectomy, percutaneous mechanical hemodynamic support, cardiac biopsy, PFO closures and ASDs, and, uh, of course, TAVRs, uh, another, another debate. Um, I also have yeah, <laughs> Dr. Zlotnick also is specialized uh, in the and focused on the evaluation and management of patients with PVD, peripheral vascular disease, including non-invasive vascular testing and endovascular interventions. He sees uh, patients at Gates Vascular Institute, where he performs a lot of peripheral and carotid angiography and interventions for peripheral artery disease. And uh, these procedures also include lower extremity atrial arthrectomy, uh, arterial, I'm sorry, lower extremity arterial arthrectomy, atherectomy, forgive me, angioplasty and stenting, renal and mesenteric artery revascularization, and subclavian interventions. He's active in research at the GVI by participating in a number of clinical trial, trials. One aims at protecting patients from <laughs> renal damage during PCI, again, refer them to surgery. Another involves an alternate procedure to perform TAVR for intermediate risk patients with symptomatic AS, aortic stenosis. Um, and that's the SIRTAVI trial, I guess, with Medtronic. And a third clinical trial address, addressing uh, using intracoronary delivery of stem cells in patients uh, with uh, posterior post-anterior myocardial infarction with ischemic left ventricular dysfunction. That's the all-star uh, and Capricor. But I can tell you now the stem cell one, I have a lot of interest in, and I think that's probably the, uh, the most effective direction that you guys will go in the interventional space um, for helping patients that are perhaps not surgical candidates or, uh, or uh, uh, their, 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 their infarct is such that revascularization alone is maybe not going to be sufficient. Um, and you're also a faculty member at University of Buffalo, Buffalo, and you teach and mentor residents and fellows during their hospital rotation. So with all of that said, forgive me for some of my, uh, my verbal slip ups, uh, but thank you very much for joining us and coming into the hostile environment of the perfusionists. So with Whoa. that said, okay. Whoa. thank you for having me. I think that uh, proves that I need to update my uh, website <laughs> <laughs> my bio and my research uh, a little bit more up to date. But thank you for that invitation. And, yes, sir. Uh, introduction. So I guess I'm going to go ahead and share my uh, presentation. Can you guys see that now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So will this allow me to? There we go. All right, now it's starting to work through. So go ahead and uh, go through the presentation. Yeah, back in. Your permission. So we're basically going to talk about the angiovac, and I know Mark's probably going to go through most of this with you guys. And this is just sort of a kind of a recap uh, for me. Uh, the angiovac suction cannula is a 22 French expandable tip cannula that goes up to 48 French when the uh, tip's expanded. When the pump started, it creates a negative pressure vortex around 80 parts per million with a flow rate of anywhere from three to five liters per minute. As we know, it's an extracorporeal blood filter system. We have to give the blood back or we'll exsanguinate the patient pretty quickly. The reinfusion cannula returns the blood back to the body through the venous system. Uh, so this is basically veno veno bypass uh, without the oxygenator. And this allows us uh, to maintain hemodynamic stability uh, through the contiguous uh, autologous reperfusion of blood back to the patient. And forgive me if Mark's kind of already gone through this, but we'll want to take a, a step to kind of go through what we as clinicians think about uh, when we're using the Angiovac, and this is the whole setup that we're seeing here. And sorry, does my mouse show up on this or? Yes, it does. Okay, perfect. So when we're looking at uh, taking care of the patient, we have to think about where the, the uh, aspect of the clot or the vegetation that we're going after is that allows us to think about what our access sites are gonna be. And as I said, for the majority of these procedures, we're doing veno veno uh, access. So in this uh, picture, the representation that we're showing here, the axis is in the right IJ through a 26 French sheath. And that's where the angiovac cannula is gonna go into. And this is the axis we use mostly when we're going after right heart structures, such as tricuspid vegetations, sometimes clot in transit in the right heart, or uh, vascular surgeons are going after iliocable thrombus. The blood is then taken back through, washed through saline into the filter. And then 
the blood goes through the centrifugal pump and is returned back to the patient through the venous system. In this representation, through uh, a reinfusion cannula that's put into the femoral venous system. Uh, the reinfusion cannula size is anywhere from 16 to 20 French. For the majority of the cases that I perform, we use an 18 French reinfusion cannula. Uh, the different uh, arrangements that can be made, you can do femoral femoral access. This is when we're trying to go up and getting tumbling clot in the right heart or if we're going into an SVC. You can even do veno veno access through the uh, bilateral IJ without having to go through the femoral veins. So realistically, you can kind of utilize any combination of these uh, uh, access sites. And in the unstable patient, uh, you can even splice in VA ECMO into your return circuit so you can maintain hemodynamic stability in an unstable patient as well as providing oxygenation. So this is kind of the crux of how we think about these cases is to have this as our starting point, kind of figure out where we're going after and figure out what our access sites are going to be. Uh, we've recently done our first LV case. I don't want to get in too involved in that, but in order for us to, you know, to have suction uh, aspiration from the left ventricle, to maintain stability while we're dropping the cardiac output, we had to actually do AA access, so return the blood through the femoral arterial system mm -hmm. to maintain stability. Mm -hmm. But for the majority, 99% of cases, venous venous access is going to be where we're going. And kind of one of the pearls that my perfusionists uh, like to remind me is to really get the ACT up before we go on pump. So generally, we're running the ACTs greater than 250 to 300 seconds. And though I'm an interventional cardiologist, I do a lot of work with our perfusionists. Uh, they're involved in our TAVR program, our STEMI program, and obviously with the Angiovac program. And so I asked them when I was giving this talk, and I've given talk to other perfusion uh, schools, what are some of the, the things that you want me to remind your colleagues about? So one of the things, these are the things that the perfusionists kind of came up with, which is that make sure that they understand this is not a heparin-coated device. So really we want to drive the ACT up, you know, over 250 to 300. And then the filter is the big thing. The filter has four prongs at the top of it. And a quarter-sized meniscus of air is okay. This allows us to trap the thrombus so make sure it doesn't go through the prongs and back to the patient. And the bubble trap system will capture small bubbles uh, so it's not going to return to the patient and cause a lot of problems. However, a large amount of air, as in any perfusion circuit, is bad. They want to make sure I, I capitalize that bad for, for that one. <laughs> and then the other thing is uh, if we're angiovacking and we get no flow, this usually means that the cannula is up against an obstruction. And we'll kind of go through with certain cases of what we do in that, in that situation, but it's not one of the things where we always want to turn the flows down. It's one of the things where we want to have a constant interaction and conversation with the physician who's utilizing the angiovac and our uh, imaging uh, people, the echocardiographer who's uh, watching what we're doing. Hey, where are you? Are you up against the wall? Are you up against an obstruction? Because if we are up against the obstruction, we obviously want to stay on flows because we've captured it. We want it to work its way into the cannula so it doesn't flick off and embolize. So really having an ongoing conversation. That'll be kind of an overall theme on this is to always have a conversation with everybody that's in the room that's participating in these procedures. So Angiovac, you know, I like to say that this was a, a, a device that was designed by two cardiothoracic surgeons at Mass General as basically to, to be a device used for pulmonary emboli, for patients with high-risk PE who were high-risk to go uh, under surgical thrombectomy procedures. What we found is once the angiovac got into the hands of, of uh, clinicians around the country and around the world, that they started using it for other indications, such as iliocable thrombus. I know you guys were just talking about some cases, uh, whether it be secondary to congenital thrombophilias or from IVC filters that have uh, thrombosed. IVC thrombosis with renal vein extension, SVC thrombosis, and we'll kind of go through that, right atrial thrombus. Pulmonary embolism, though, though it was created for pulmonary embolism, early on the success rate for the use of uh, the angiovac device in its current iteration for uh, pulmonary embolism is less than 15%. So really that indication is kind of fallen by the wayside. Uh, thrombus attached to intracardiac devices, including PFO closure devices, as well as for uh, congenital heart uh, circuits is what it's been used for. So we, first thing I want to talk about is right heart thrombus. Obviously, as a cardiologist, the heart's close to my mind always. The presence of free-floating right heart thrombus is a predictor of hemodynamic decompensation, cardiac arrest, and mortality, even in patients that are treated with heparin. In patients who present to the hospital with a massive pulmonary emboli, if we look for it, whether we do echo or CT imaging, 4 to 18 percent of those patients will have evidence of a free-floating right heart thrombus at the time of uh, uh, their hospitalization. 
And when they have both a pulmonary emboli and right heart thrombus, their mortality in the hospital is anywhere from 27 to 44%. So these are the sickest of the sick patients. Well, how do we treat these patients? Well, we could just anticoagulate them alone and hope that they don't embolize. However, that does you know, increase the risk that if it embolizes that they could decompensate and then we don't really have a lot of good therapies emergently other than to give them IV thrombolytics. We can give them IV thrombolytics, but then we have to take on the bleeding risk. We're giving a large dose of IV thrombolytics into a peripheral IV, so we have to give usually 100 milligrams to get that to circulate and to get it to where we want it to go. In the clinical trials, the bleeding risk, major bleeding risk is around 15%. In actual practice, based on registry data, it's about 20%. The risk of intracranial hemorrhage is around 2 to 3%. And the other concern is that if we give IV thrombolytics and we have incomplete dissolution of clot and that, that part embolizes, we could take a stable situation where we have clot already in the pulmonary vasculature. We've now embolized additional clot. We've now taken a stable situation and made it unstable. The mainstay of therapy have, has been for these patients to go on for surgical uh, thrombectomy or embolectomies. However, in unstable patients, even in the best of hands, uh, based on the literature, we're having a 40% mortality, in-hospital mortality for those patients. And in stable patients, 25 to 30% mortality. And again, this is in published literature for high volume centers. So you can see that the majority of centers around the, the country are probably not the high volume centers. These mortality rates may be even higher. And obviously the mortality rates are higher in patients with concomitant pulmonary embolism that are already complicated by RV dysfunction. And this may be a sweet spot where mechanical thrombectomy uh, may play a role. So this is a case presentation. Uh, this is a 65-year-old male uh, with diabetes who was transferred uh, from a, another institution for further management of worsening dyspnea and lower extremity edema. On presentation in that hospital, he was in an atrial tachyarrhythmia with the rate, rapid ventricular rate, heart rates in the 150s to 160s. Every time they tried to slow his heart rate down with a calcium channel blocker or beta blocker, he became hemodynamically unstable. On presentation, he was found to be in uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, acute kidney injury, and profound thrombocytopenia with a platelet count less than 20,000. Upon arrival, we emergently got a CT scan of the torso just to make sure, and we found no evidence of widely metastatic disease. And an echocardiogram was performed and showed severe biventricular dysfunction with an EF of 20%. And hopefully this is projecting. I know this is a little bit blurry, but... If you take a look here, this is the right atrium and the right ventricle, and the left ventricle is tacking away. But you can see right in here, when this is playing, let me play it again, there's basically a tumbling thrombus in the right atrium that's going across the tricuspid valve. Yep. We'll so, see it. Play it again. Did we freeze? I can't hear him. Is he there? Have we lost him? Somebody? Uh, maybe because, because he's playing some, some, some audio from his computer and it's like his mic off. The video is off. Hmm. Yeah, I think this is an abnormal delay. It, it sounds like there's, that. There's something. Okay. There's some, hmm. All right, you guys, are, you guys are still with me? Yes, we got you back. Okay, perfect. So what you can see here is uh, we're in the hybrid operating room, and we did an angiovac to get rid of this clot. And one of the things that we wanted to discuss here in this case was that this patient has a tumbling thrombus in the right atrium. We presume that he also had concomitant pulmonary emboli with biventricular dysfunction. And one of the things with you know severe pulmonary emboli and right, and right ventricular dysfunction is that if you intubate these patients, you guys have probably seen this, that they, they have a tendency to, to crash on you. You take away their adrenergic tone as well as their preload to their heart, they become hemodynamically unstable. And we've seen this a lot where they actually start to code. So we actually did this under max sedation without intubating the patient. And we used trans uh, uh, thoracic guidance instead of transesophageal guidance. And the clot was big enough that we could see it. So what you don't see is over here on this other side of the table, it's the, sur the surgeon I work with as well as my echocardiographer doing surface echo. And when we got in there, we went from an IJ approach. As soon as we went on flows, we lost, we lost flow. And so we waited for two minutes, let the clot kind of work its way in the cannula. And after two minutes, I just started to gently advance my cannula and retract it. And we could see that the clot was moving just on transthoracic with the cannula. So we knew that the clot had worked its way into the cannula. And I brought it out through the gore dry seal sheath. And you can see it basically 
about a third of the clot was in the cannula with two thirds still out and everything kind of came out. And here's the, the, the tumbling thrombus it was just under 10 centimeters. And you can see that the, the, the width of this was basically the, almost the width of the internal diameter of the angiobat cannula. And this is the uh, post transthoracic echo just to prove that we had re gotten rid of the clot uh, that was there. So I think this is kind of a, a nice case to, to go through just a couple of the hemodynamic principles, which is that the patients with PE with underlying cardiac dysfunction, the, these are still procedures we can do with max sedation uh, in the operating room and really get rid of this clot. So kind of continuing on with the thrombectomy uh, theme, the second case, this is a 65-year-old female who's two months after uh, bypass surgery. She has end-stage renal disease, and she's on dialysis. And after bypass surgery, she was discharged with a right-side permacath for dialysis access. Well, she got admitted with MRSA bacteremia. It was suspected that this was a line infection, and the permacath was removed. However, the patient remained bacteremic despite line removal and IV antibiotic therapy. And this was nine days after admission. She was still bacteremic. At this point, our infectious disease uh, colleagues uh, recommended getting a TEE to rule out endocarditis. And this is a T trans uh, esophageal image. And what you can see here, just to orient people, this is the right atrium, intraatrial septum, and then this is the SVC. And what we can see here is a large mobile thrombus in the SVC. And you can see there's a mobile component right here at the SVC RA junction. So in this instance, what was presumed was going on was that she developed a large SVC thrombus and that the thrombus was actually the ongoing nutus for her continuing bacteremia despite the line being removed. And we're seeing more and more of these as people are being discharged from the hospital with more and more lines such as PIC lines or permacasts or metaports. Um, so in this instance, we ended up bringing her for an angiovac and because we were angiovacing the SVC, we decided to come from below. So coming up through the IVC, it's a straight shot from the right, through the right atrium up to the SVC. And this is what we're seeing here. Here's the angiovac cannula. This is uh, the second generation. So we have the, uh, the balloon tip and we're coming up, working our way through the right atrium up into the SVC and just kind of debulking the clot a little bit at a time. And here's another transesophageal image. Now for these, Can you text him and tell him that, uh, that the video messes up his sound? So he needs to play the, yeah. Say that again. It's cutting his mic, yeah, because his, his overloading his computer. So he's got to play the video and then make the commentary. Right. Yeah. What's enough on me again? Okay. Hey, Dr. Zlotnick. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but what happens is when you play those videos, um, you, your mic is cutting out. And so if, if and I, I hate to ask you to do this, but if you could go back to yes. that video and don't play the video, but let, it, let us see the video play, but then narrate after it has played, because we really missed pretty much everything that you said from that point forward until it just gotcha. came back on. All right, so it's just an issue with the, uh, perfect. So, I'll play the video. Mm -hmm. And so what, what we're seeing here, this is the, to, to kind of go through, this is the right atrium, and here's your SVC. And what we can see here is basically a large clot, and you can see a mobile component, oh, sorry about that, right here at the SVC RA junction. Mm -hmm. And again, this is something that we're seeing more and more of is people are leaving the hospital with different types of lines, such as PIC lines, metaports, permacasts. So we're seeing more and more of this. And even though the line was removed, the ongoing bacteremia was being caused by this persistent uh, clot that was sitting in the SVC. So this clot is, uh, is super infected with the MRSA, which was giving her persistent bacteremia. And what I was showing in this video is the all right what i'm showing in this video is basically the angiovac cannula coming up through the ivc through the right atrium and then here's the balloon tip with the funnel basically debulking the thrombus in the svc 
And after we got done, this is what the filter looked like. So we got a lot of oh my material God. thrombus. And we were able to debulk. Now, again, what I was saying for these cases, this is not clot that we're going to be able to readily see on a transthoracic echocardiogram. So for these patients, we have to intubate them and use TE imaging for us to see. But for the majority of our SVC patients, actually for all the SVC patients that I've done, we've always gone from the from below intubate with TE imaging. And happy to report that 24 hours after this procedure, she was uh, uh, bacteremic free, her cultures had cleared, and she was discharged home on post-operative day five with IV antibiotics and a Shiley catheter from a di different access site. So again, you know, the one thing that the infectious disease doctors we work very closely with because a lot of the angiovax, the majority of the angiovax that I do are for some sort of ongoing bacteremia, whether it be from endocarditis or from, from clot, uh, that getting source control is a major, major uh, 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 thing that we need to do for these patients in order to allow the antibiotics and the medical therapy uh, uh, to clear up the remaining infection. So if we can't get source control, the antibiotics that they're giving uh, are not going to get these patients bacteremic free, and we want to really get get to these patients before they seed other areas of the of the body. Mm -hmm. With that, kind of transition over to infectious endocarditis. And, you know, kind of just going through the uh, pathophysiology of this is that normal heart valves are usually resistant to clot and infection forming. And that's because of the endothelial uh, uh, layer. The endothelial cells really prevent platelet aggregation. However, when injury occurs to the valve tissue, then you basically get uh, the subendothelial collagen layer getting exposed. And that's where the platelet and fiber aggregation can occur with bacterial seeding. So what happens, bacterial seeds on that, that collagen layer, and then the platelet fibrin aggregates around it and creates sort of a force field, so to speak. And that excludes our host antibodies and our immune system as well as the antibiotics that we're given so that that infection can continue to run rampant. Uh, things like, you know, organisms such as Staph aureus can directly contribute to the valve damage. Uh, as well as bacteria can contribute to vegetation proliferation. So really what we're trying to do is, with these vegetations form, is we need to get rid of that platelet fibrin cap and allow our antibiotics and our body's immune system to, and the antibi uh, our antibodies, to get down there be, be, uh, beyond that layer to where the infection is and really try to uh, allow that to clear the infection. Unfortunately, uh, the IV drug use is, uh, and the opioid epidemic uh, is running rampant in our country as well as around the world. IV drug use has doubled over just the last 10 years, and there's been a 12-fold increase in hospitalizations amongst people who use intravenous drug use. And again, in just the last 10 years, the cases of uh, infective endocarditis from IV drug use has gone up from 15% of hospitalized cases to 30%. Uh, so this is something that we're seeing, unfortunately, more and more of. The majority of right side infective endocarditis uh, do occur in the intravenous drug use population. About 10 to 25 percent of all cases of in infective endocarditis are from the right sided uh, uh, structures, whether it be the tricuspid, pulmonic, RVOT. If a patient with IV drug use presents with a fever, 13 percent of them will have evidence of infective endocarditis on admission. If they're bacteremic on admission, 41 percent of them will have evidence of infective endocarditis on admission. And clinical manifestations of, of infective endocarditis are fever and sepsis, with septic pulmonary emboli being the big uh, feature because, again, the majority of these patients are developing vegetations on the right side of valves, which are mobile, breaking off, going to the lungs. So these patients will present with chest pain, dyspnea, a cough, hemoptysis. And what we're really concerned about, and we've seen this, is that these patients then trash their lungs. And I hate to use that term, but their lungs become so filled with abscess that even if we can get the heart cleared, the lungs are gone, and we have no ability to bring these patients back. So really, the, the sweet spot for these patients is to get to them early before their lungs have been riddled with abscess and before they've lost their lung function. And for me, you know, when we see these patients, we bring our pulmonologists on very early on to kind of help us to understand what's the underlying lung function, what's going on uh, from the standpoint of their ventilator requirements, and is this somebody that we can recover from a lung standpoint uh, before we go in and start tackling their heart. Well, treatment obstacles in this pa patient population are, are difficult. One thing is that these patients are non-adherent to treatment and non-compliant with medical follow-up. The good news is the overall mortality for right side infective endocarditis is anywhere from 10 to 30 percent, and 70 to 80 percent of these cases will resolve with antibiotic therapy alone. These patients do require multidisciplinary management, and I don't mean that just from a physician standpoint, but 
from a nursing standpoint, social work standpoint, substance abuse counseling, it really does uh, take uh, a lot of people coming together to treat these patients. The indications for surgical management, uh, you know, historically have been patients who've developed refractory right heart failure, secondary to severe tricuspid regurgitation, despite medical therapy. If patients have had sustained infection caused by a difficult to treat organism or a lack of uh, response to appropriate antibiotic therapy, and when we think of difficult to treat organisms, the ones that we think the most are, are MRSA and uh, uh, fungal organisms. If the vegetation is greater than one to two centimeters, especially if it's greater than two centimeters, because this is associated with a tenfold increase in in-hospital mortality risk. And obviously if they have recurrent septic pulmonary emboli, despite uh, optimal medical therapy, these are patients that are at high risk to, uh, to uh, have adverse outcomes in their lungs. When I talk to my surgical colleagues, I ask them, well, what are the surgical principles to treating these patients when you're thinking about taking these patients to the OR? And what they constantly tell me is they want to radically debride the vegetations in the infective tissue, but they want to avoid uh, the implantation of prosthetic material after they debride. And this is especially true in the intravenous drug use population because they don't know at that time if the patients are going to stop the high-risk activities that got them there in the first place. Mm -hmm. and what they don't want to do is have these patients come back with prosthetic valve endocarditis because that that becomes a much bigger issue to treat down the line. So ideally, they'd like to perform a vagectomy or even if they have to, a complete valvectomy without leaving any prosthetic material behind because the majority of patients, especially young patients, can live without their tricuspid valve for, for a while. They may have a little bit of heart failure symptoms, but this is not something that's going to overwhelmingly uh, uh, cause mortality in them. Then bring them back after the fact after they've cleaned up, they stop using their high-risk activities, and then if they need to, either proceed on to a tricuspid valve repair or replacement at that point. Ideally, they like to delay surgery in these patients until the, sterile, the cultures are sterile, just to decrease the risk of, of, of having uh, any type of surgical uh, material become infected. When we look at the historical literature, and again in high-volume centers, the complications of perioperative surgical management in these patients, their surgical mortality is still anywhere from 6 to 10%. Also, some of the other issues that my surgical colleagues like to tell me is that, hey, these are patients that are withdrawing from opioids. At the same time, I'm trying to control their post-operative pain. So that becomes a, a very uh, 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 dicey interplay uh, in the post-operative uh, period. They also have issues with the respiratory status, especially in patients with septic pulmonary emboli, trying to manage the ventilator uh, after an open heart procedure. And then obviously, complete surgical valvectomy can result in high morbidity from right heart failure in these patients. And I think this is really where angiovac is taken off because the goals of therapy for angiovac is what we want to do is reduce the vegetative load on the valve or in the right heart. And this allows us to decrease the infectious burden, get rid of that platelet fibrin uh, cap on the, on the vegetation, and allow the antibiotics that are, are being given to, to clear up the remaining infection. So we're not trying to go in there and completely clear the valve of all the infection. We want to get debulked. We like to say that a, a successful debulking is if we can get 60% or more of the vegetative load off the valve. And what we're really trying to do is just strip that platelet fibrin cap and allows the, the body's immune system and the antibiotics to really resolve the rest of it. By getting in there and doing that, we also want to decrease further valve destruction as well as decrease risk of further septic pulmonary uh, emboli. So the way I like to talk to my colleagues about it is that what we're doing with angiovac is we're really trying to take a patient who may have been surgical, do a, a procedure, and then continue to treat them medically. So this doesn't replace the need for antibiotics or replace the duration of antibiotic therapy, but is actually an adjunct to medical therapy with antibiotics. And ideally, what we'd like to do is be able to recover these patients, and then if, again, they're not using, they're, they stop doing the high-risk activities that got them involved in the first place, and they start having morbidity from right heart failure from severe TR, and 6, 12, 24 months later, that's when we think about come bringing them back and doing a tricuspid valve repair or replacement. Sure. So let's go through uh, just a quick study. This was a couple years ago. This was a, a single uh, center retrospective study of 33 patients that they used angiovac for right-side infective endocarditis. And what they did was they looked at their historical institutional mortality of right-side endocarditis, which was 28%. So a little bit at the upper end of uh, the published data. And what they did was they used angiovac and found a 61% average reduction in the vegetative size on the post-procedure echo. 
100% procedural survival with three patients proceeding on to elective tricuspid valve repair or replacement for severe TR, and they had 90% survival to discharge. So to me, this is the data that we use for our own internal quality uh, uh, pro uh, assessment program to say what we're doing for our patients, this is the kind of data that we want to match with our program. And this is uh, in line with what most institutions would want to have. So with that, bring to a case presentation. This is a 22-year-old female, past medical history remarkable for hepatitis C and heroin abuse, who was transferred from our, our county hospital. She presented with one week of flu-like symptoms. She was found to have sep uh, sepsis secondary to methicillin-sensitive staph aureus bacteremia. IV antibiotic therapy was started, and an echocardiogram was uh, performed demonstrating tricuspid valve endocarditis. She had multiple vegetations, one and a half to two and a half centimeters, with moderate tricuspid regurgitation, and she did have evidence of septic pulmonary emboli on a CT scan. So I'm going to play the TE, then I'll pause it, and we'll discuss. 22 years old. Mm -hmm. That's just sad. I think it must be a bandwidth issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he's not even playing. And not talking. I think his computer's blowing up. Mm -hmm. I can see it though already. You mm -hmm. see it. Mm -hmm. It's fairly obvious. Once it gets there, it's like flocks on a dryer if it actually runs. <laughs> can you chat with him and tell him we can't hear him yet? That it's uh, just so he knows. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. We can hear you now. All right. So it seems like every time I play a movie, the uh, we, we freeze for about 30 seconds. So I'll just wait till you guys come back. But. So there's multiple uh, frond-like vegetations uh, attached to the tricuspid valve. So this is really where we were going after. And I'll let the next movie play, but what it'll, it'll show is the angiovac coming in from an IJ approach, so coming from the SVC into the right atrium, coming down on the tricuspid valve. So I'm going to show that now, so I'm sure we're going to pause. Yeah, it's the SVC. Yeah, coming yeah. in. See him. Are you guys still with me? Yes. Yes, sir. All right, perfect. So this is our the filter afterwards, and these are the multiple frond-like vegetations that we were able to get after we debulked. And I'm going to show the post uh, transesophageal echo uh, pick. Dave, if you can hear me, you can. You're still breaking up. Gotta love technology. Yes. And live shows. <laughs> right. And we're live. Always okay. happens live, right? This is live. Always live. Go big, go home. There you go. You're back. All right, you guys are back? We well, got you back. Yeah. Yep. So we were able to do about 90% of the vegetation. All we had left was that just that linear uh, vegetation. Uh, so we deemed this to be a very successful angiovac. And actually, right after we uh, angiovac 24 hours later, again, her culture's cleared post-procedure. Mm -hmm. She remained in the hospital, obviously, given the high risk. Nobody was going to discharge her with a PICC line. So she remained in the hospital, got, received a course of IV antibiotic therapy. Uh, she was started on methadone for management of her polysubstance abuse. She got social work support and substance abuse counseling. And she had outpatient follow-up in the methadone clinic, and she was discharged mm -hmm. home. I actually saw her uh, this summer, one year after the angiovac, and she's doing very well. She's uh, has employment, has a stable uh, relationship, and she's mad at me because uh, since the angiovac, she's put on 90 pounds. <laughs> very good. <laughs> we like to, uh, That's to a say that this story. is a, a, a success story that we're giving these patients an opportunity to change their life around. Now, one of the things, uh, this is with the second generation angiovac device, and I think Mark kind of went over the, the design changes between angiovac 2 and angiovac gen 3. But I just wanted to kind of point out what we were working with, which was basically a 20-degree bend. Now, in this schematic, it looks like the 20-degree bend will be just enough to get us to the tricuspid valve. But in, uh, in actual practice, that 20-degree bend gets us right into the IVC and not near the tricuspid valve. So we had to figure out ways that we could make this do what we want or go where we want it to go. And so two different techniques that, that uh, were developed was one where we basically suture, put a suture in at the tip funnel, and then that suture would be externalized, and as you pulled that suture, that would basically pull the angiovac and give it more of a 90-degree bend. The uh, 
I never did that. The technique that I used was to, to, to do a second stick in the IJ and put a gooseneck snare around the device and then use the snare to pull up on the device. Yeah. And I'll show you a picture or a video of that, that a good idea. right here. Yeah, we see the snare. Yeah, we yeah. see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, so. So the snare allowed us to maneuver the device, but thankfully, uh, uh, Andrew Dynamics came out with Gen 3 after uh, seeing what we've struggled with. And I think Mark kind of went over this, but basically there's a, the oversheath and there's two different cannulas. There's the C180 and the C20. Again, I just did a C20 uh, a procedure last week for an SVC thrombus. That curve is about what we need to get up, you know, straight through the IVC in the right, right atrium and up to the SVC. But for the uh, endocarditis, the, especially the tricuspid valve, the C180 is really kind of almost, I hate to use revolutionary, but it's been, you know, a godsend for us. It's really made the procedure easier and faster. And so as it comes out through the sheath, we can actually control the amount of bend that the, the cannula makes anywhere from around 60 all the way to 180 degrees. And unfortunately, I think this next uh, slide is going to have both video images as well as just still frame uh, fluoroscopic images of the C180 cannula. Um, this was a tricuspid endocarditis case that we recently did uh, in this patient. And so you can see the, the uh, vegetations on the tricuspid valve coming in from an IJ approach. And you can see here is the oversheath. And then here's the C180 coming out. And in this instance, we're making about a 70 to 80 degree bend, which takes us right onto the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid uh, valve. And we're able to rapidly debulk this. And just to show the amount of bend that we can make right here and to really kind of go after the tricuspid annulus and, and continue to debulk, this procedure time, uh, we looked at this. We were uh, had the angiovac catheter in the patient for less than 14 minutes. And our stick to closure time was less than 45 minutes with this device. So really uh, made it quicker. And as I like to tell my fellows, the longer patients on the table, the more chance for complications. So we don't want to rush through these procedures, but at the same time, be able to do these patients, you know, these uh, uh, quickly uh, will, I think, in, in long term, reduce the risks to our patients. And I'm not going to, I'll just, you know, pause that video, but we had a rapid debulking, and you can see that the filter, we had a lot of the material in the wow. filter afterwards. Wow. Everybody and this was wow. the... Uh, we we'll all say it, don't we? Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. So Mark was there for this, uh, the, our, our, our first, uh, first Angiovac Gen 3 case. So it's a little bit of that. So kind of moving on, one of the other things that we, we treat a lot is device lead infections. So device lead infection rates are anywhere from 1% to 20%. Mortality rates are anywhere from 30 to 60% if it's treated with antibiotics alone. And 13 to 33% if uh, you give antibiotic therapy as well as removal of the lead. When I'm talking about device leads, I'm talking about pacemakers, BIV, ICD, defibrillators, leads. So historically, if a vegetation is greater than one centimeter, surgical thoracotomy for removal of the hardware is performed to decrease the risk of septic embolization. However, if you think about in our, our population, especially the aging population, who's getting pacemakers and defibrillators? It's usually more the elderly. And these are high-risk patients uh, to bring back to do surgical thoracotomies uh, and sternotomies on. So percutaneous lead removal has been developed as a safe and efficacious uh, uh, alternative to doing open surgical procedures. However, in patients who have large uh, vegetations, the risk of septic pulmonary embolization is anywhere from 34 to 55 percent. And this is really where angiovac-assisted uh, lead removal uh, may play a role. So the Heart Rhythm Society and the European Heart uh, Rhythm Association recommends complete device and lead removal in patients with definitive cardiac implantable device infections if they have valvular endocarditis, lead endocarditis, and sepsis, if they have a pocket infection, if they have valvular endocarditis, even if there's no definitive uh, evidence of lead involvement, or if there's an occult gram-positive bacteremia that we, we can't identify. So this takes us into a case. This is a 28-year-old male with mitochondrial disorder, Crohn's disease, and paroxysmal syncope, secondary to high-grade AV block. He was having such debilitating syncope, uh, it was probably vasovagal, but because of uh, these profound syncopal episodes, a dual-chamber pacemaker was placed seven years prior. He had had a Metaport placed, excuse me, 
for infusions for his mitochondrial disorder. And unfortunately, he was admitted to our hospital with a staph bacteremia. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the TEE, and I'll kind of point out, on this TEE, you'll see a large vegetative burden, not only on the uh, pacemaker leads, but as well as a large vegetative burden on the right atrial wall, including a cystic structure. And you'll see that here. Yeah, that's not supposed to be in there. <laughs> yeah, so not, not very subtle. So... Again, we got a multidisciplinary team together, and we took a look. And again, with this, though he was a young kid, he, the mitochondrial disorder was almost mimicking such a, a neuromuscular disorder that we thought he would be a little bit higher risk for recovery after a, a sternotomy. And so what we decided to do was to do an angiovac-assisted laser lead extraction in this patient. And I'll kind of walk you through the procedure. What we ended up doing was we ended up coming from uh, below. So we did a, a venous venous femoral approach came up from below using the snare, and that snare allowed us to, to torque the catheter to really get on the pacemaker leads and debulk not only the pacemaker leads, but also the right atrial wall. And this is the vegetation from the pacemaker lead, as well as that cystic structure that we were seeing on the right atrial free wall. After uh, we did that, we actually left the angiovac in the right atrium with a wire, a, a stiff wire up into the SVC while they removed the leads. If the leads caused a tear in the SVC, we would be able to quickly remove our angiovac cannula out and put up an occlusion balloon. But the reason we wanted to keep the angiovac in was that if any debris on the lead came off while they were removing it, we'd capture it in our angiovac instead of having it go to the, to the, uh, to the lungs. So that's what we did. Everything went well. We're all high-fiving afterwards until my echocardiographer says, well, hold the phone. Now that the leads are out, I can see this. And that was a mobile vegetation that was attached to the right atrial free wall that we could only see after the leads were out. And so what we did was we went back in with the angiovac. I was able to get the angiovac on that. I was able to, to get it up against the, uh, the, the tip of the angiovac. And then I used a snare, put the snare over it, cinched down, took it off the wall, and then externalized it out. And that's what it looked like after we got that out. Wow. There it is again. Now, wow. yeah. now the, the <laughs> next slide is going to show the post-procedure uh, TE, which will still show kind of a shaggy vegetation material that's uh, attached to the wall around the, the right atrium without a large uh, vegetation. Yeah, I see it. So he's pointing mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that we thought was an acceptable when we treated him with an antibiotics. And so he was treated with four weeks of IV antibiotics. And then one of my EP colleagues put in a leadless pacemaker, which is a micro, which is what we're seeing here, because his pacemaking uh, requirements were only about 7% of the time. And this was four weeks later. And before she put it in, she did a TEE. And this is what the right atrial wall looked like. Basically completely normal. So completely normal right atrial wall. So it just shows you that even though we're not getting complete debulking of every infectious material, we're debulking enough to allow the IV antibiotic therapy to really uh, go in and finish the job. So with the last couple minutes that I have, I thought I'd go through you know, why I think uh, programs should think about starting an angiovac program. And well, clinical benefits is that this is a minimally invasive procedure. Uh, is, it gives us the ability to treat patients who may not be surgical candidates or who may be high risk for, for surgery. Obviously, we want to decrease the risk of blood loss. We're giving the blood back to the patient, as well as no sacomial infections. And we want to avoid leaving prosthetic material behind that may become super infected. There may be economic benefits, such as decreased uh, length of stay in the hospital, as well as decreased ICU and hospital stays. So how to start an angiovac program is a question that I get asked a lot by my colleagues around the country. And I think the first thing we need to do is to identify champions in the institution, whether it be an interventional cardiologist, an interventional radiologist, vascular surgeon, CT surgeon, perfusionist, you know, somebody who's going to, uh, to champion this technology. And obviously, we need to engage our hospital leadership and administration because this is not a, uh, a light expense. And I think that anytime we start programs, uh, we need to have quality assurance uh, monitoring how the program is going, what we're doing, making sure we're doing the right things for our patients. If you're in an institution, you have to understand what is the institutional resources that I have available to me. Do I have a cath lab or IR suite or a hybrid OR that I'm going to be planning to do these procedures in? What kind of advanced imaging do I have available to me, whether it be TE, CAT scan, MRI? 
And then obviously, do I have the access to perfusionists and CT surgery? And then you also, you want to identify what are the clinical needs of my institution? So what patient population and diseases are I going to be treating? Uh, and what are the, the standard of care currently? And what are the historical outcomes? Because those are going to be the benchmarks with which we're going to compare any new procedure or technology that we're using. And for me, again, collaboration is paramount. So the models that I like to use are the structural heart team for TAVR, right? This is a when we brought multiple people, whether it be imaging, CT surgeons, interventional cardiologists, heart failure cardiologists, everybody together to kind of look at a patient together and say, what's the right decision for this patient uh, at this time? And we started developing these same teams for pulmonary embolism management as well as for cardiogenic shock. And so really we want to encourage collaboration and collegiality rather than trying to protect my turf. This is my patient. I'm going to treat this patient. And so to me, the best interest of the patient should trump all. And then obviously we want to have the appropriate patient selection. As uh, when I got in, Mark was kind of talking about the five things that he thinks about when he is uh, recommending angiovac. It's really we want to have multidisciplinary evaluation and review all the imaging and understand is this the right patient that we should be thinking about angiovac on and get additional input. Get input from our infectious disease colleagues, our pulmonary critical care colleagues, anesthesiologists, and perfusion. Some of the high risk cases, we all get together beforehand and we have a, a pre procedural huddle where we kind of think about what are all the contingency plans that we need to be thinking of if uh, in this patient. And that's why I, it's a, nice for me as an endovascular specialist to be working side by side with, my, with one of our cardiothoracic surgeons, because we can bring a diverse skill set and resources to each case. And we have the ability to make up a contingency plan if the unexpected occurs. Are we gonna convert this to an open surgical procedure? Are we gonna be able to support this patient with mechanical hematomic support and ECMO? And one of the things that I would like to say is that there is a learning curve to these. You know, careful patient selection early on is going to be paramount to making sure that the program is successful, right? Get, get certain cases under the belt, get to understand how the technology works, how the device works. Um, clinical support, whether it be provided by physicians around the country or, or angiodynamics is important. And physician mentorship, having somebody who's done a lot of these to be able to talk through cases, uh, to me early on in our experience was very helpful. And so we, we started our formal program in September of 2017. So we've just been a little bit over two years into our program. We've done 46 cases, 35 for the management of right side infective endocarditis, 25 for tricuspid RBOT vegetations or infected SDC thrombus, nine for pacemaker ICD lead endocarditis. And we've done 11 cases for RA, RV thrombus, SVC or pacemaker lead thrombus, one for foreign body and one for an LV papillary fibroastoma. Our procedural success rate, uh, which we say is a greater than 50% reduction in either vegetation or thrombus burden by echo is 96%. We have 100% procedural survival and an 84% survival to discharge uh, with for right side infective endocarditis being 88%. So right in line with the historical data that, that we're seeing. So again, the importance of having a quality program to be able to take a look back through our, our outcomes and say, where can we be better? Where can we improve? And with that, I'll conclude. And thank you very much for your attention. Very nice. Very, very nice. good. That was, that was excellent. Our online viewers are applauding as well, just so you know. <laughs> um, a couple of things I have is just one, one quick comment. If you'll send your videos in, uh, Dr. Zlotnick, we can edit the, uh, the, uh, the tape that we have so that we get your videos playing more seamlessly when people watch this later, because we'll have a post editing. It'll still live live as is, but they'll be able to watch the edited sure. video and we can fix that if you could just make sure we get that. Um, but I don't think enough is, I don't think enough is appreciated uh, in the uh, use of, uh, of uh, high dose antibiotics, especially when you're making cocktails with various different ones and the effect on the uh, kidneys, because I think that's a, uh, another huge problem. But I wanted to uh, make that comment and then uh, turn it over to Tammy first, and we'll go down the line with some discussion if you have time for that. Mm -hmm. I have one quick question. So I um, wrote down your comment that uh, about 60% is considered average uh, for vegetation removal. Are, are you going to try to get as much as you can possible yeah. Or is it get uh, you know a certain amount of time that you're manipulating this, and then you think that's that's enough, and let's go ahead and um, be done. Our filters full, or or what have you, uh, to decrease any kind of risk. What what? How did you come up with that particular uh, percentage? Yeah, again, that was just based on the historical uh, uh, 
you know, paper from George at all, uh, where they use 60% as their kind of benchmark. So we kind of use that. Most, for the majority of the time, we're, we're aiming for more closer to 80 to 90% vegetation removal. But that being said, you know, we're going with the device. We're trying to to debulk as much of the large mobile component as we can, because that's really what we're trying to do is to decrease the embolization and really kind of get rid of that platelet fibrin aggregate layer. And so when we see these, you know, after we get done with uh, debulking, we constantly will go in, we'll debulk, and then we'll, we'll retract the angiovac cannula, and then my echocardiographer uh, will, will survey the valve, and he'll let me know, okay, I still see a large vegetation, now it's on the septal leaflet, let's, you know, get the angiovac over there, or, hey, you know, the large com mobile component's gone, all I see is a small, fi you know, fibrin strand, I think this is enough, then we'll go. So it's, it's constantly an interplay between myself and the echocardiographer who's, who's monitoring us with the transesophageal of what we're trying to do. So we're, we're trying to get as much of the material as we can, but that being said, if we don't have 100% uh, removal, we're, we're okay, because what we're finding, and we're finding this a lot, is that we can debulk 60, 70, 80% of that and get rid of that layer the antibiotics are going to clear up the rest. So again, this is an adjunct to medical therapy as a replacement for doing an open surgical procedure. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. And the key too is to remove that biofilm outer right, layer to go ahead of, and break the, that apart. Mm -hmm. of the right of the infection and now you've exposed it so that the antibiotics can actually get in there right. and, and do something with it. Okay. It's a good thank question. You. Very good. Very thank good you. comments. Mark? I've asked you so many questions I don't know that I can, uh, that I can come up with a new one, but I'm going to try. Um, on the 60 to 80 percent that you're talking about, um, as far as making this something you would consider to be successful, do you see any change in the clinical presentation based on the amount that you're able to remove, both in the immediate time after the procedure and also long term to get full resolution or acceptable resolution of their sepsis? So, I think what you're trying to ask is, is you know, and, and this is, is something I say is that on. our the principles of angiovac in these cases are we want to get to these patients early on. Right, so we want to get to these patients, you know, get try to debulk as much as we can before the vegetation and the infection has caused overwhelming tissue destruction to the underlying valve. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, is how patients, when and how patients present, right? So a lot of these patients, they get so sick that when they, when they present, they're already in overwhelming sepsis with severe tricuspid regurgitation. So, but one of the things that we do see is, is that if we can debulk, we can get rid of the, you know, try to get them bacteremic free, try to get rid of the sepsis early on. So we, as a general principle, try to get to these patients early on in their hospitalization instead of waiting for the, sep you know, trying to wait for the sepsis to completely run its course and then going after the, the vegetation. So generally, we're trying to angiovac these patients within about 72 hours of their our presentation if it's feasible uh, for us to do. Obviously, every patient's a little bit different, but I think an angiovac principle is to try to think about these debulking early on. One of the other questions that I get a lot from physicians is, when you're debulking, do you get this overwhelming inflammatory reaction? You know, you're, you're stirring up the pot, so to speak. You get, we haven't seen that. That's not something that we see. Our cardiac anesthesiologists who are running these cases, they see hemodynamic stability through all this. We're, 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 we just haven't seen that kind of overwhelming distributive picture where the, the pressure just goes and these patients just vasodilate. So that's been reassuring to us that we're not really stirring up more of an inflammatory milieu and, and you know, causing this cytokine surge uh, by doing this. So yeah. we think going in earlier on in their hospitalization, kind of decreasing the, the, the sepsis burden, the bacteremic burden, the vegetative burden uh, is probably more beneficial. Well, yeah, and I would think, you know, if I can add to that, I would, I would imagine that the you know you're going to have a surge response secondary to the sepsis itself and so i can't imagine that a closed loop circuit with that little surface area no you know with the heart lung machine it's generally the reservoir and the pump suckers mm -hmm. and the blood air interface and all of these other variables plus sternotomy which sort of flares all of this up this is a minimally invasive procedure with a relatively small surface area um, so I couldn't imagine that it would have a more, uh, it, would be, it would be a more impactful stimulus for inflammatory response than the underlying infection has on its own. That's my thought. Yeah, that's what we're seeing. So. Mm -hmm. Professor Stephanie? Hi. I really appreciated what you were saying about um, having the team approach and going about it as what's best for the patient and having a plan. And I was wondering when you started your program, 
did you just start when you saw a couple of cases here and there and brought it in, or did you say, we're going to start uh, an angiovac program uh, and, and set it up and then start doing cases? So it, <laughs> let me give you the background on how we started our program, and it'll kind of explain where we were. So when I got to Buffalo about five years ago, early on, uh, we started a PERT program. And so I'm the medical director of our, of our PERT program. And so we started doing pulmonary embolism interventions. Uh, and we were seeing about 250 consults in our first year. Now, we didn't do interventions on 250 patients. So it was only about 20%. But we were seeing these patients. And we saw a very small subset of patients that we couldn't treat because they had right heart thrombus in transit. And so these patients were either going on for surgery or we were, you know, were transitioning or transferring them to other institutions. And we were looking at our historical surgical mortality for these patients, which is in keeping with the published literature, was pretty high. Mm -hmm. So that's when uh, we started to say, well, is there a potential other therapy that we could, and we got in, that's when we approached angiodynamics and got angiovac in. So, you know, there's a surgeon that I work very closely with, uh, and so when we were getting in-serviced for the angiovac program, our clinical uh, uh, specialist, Kurt, was saying, oh, by the way, to my surgeon, you know, people are using angiovac for tricuspid endocarditis. Mm -hmm. So my surgeon horse collar tackled me and said, wait a minute, we can do this instead of uh, uh, doing open, you know, surgical procedures. What, let's start thinking about this. And he was the largest referral from the county hospital for these uh, IV drug use tricuspid endocarditis cases. Mm -hmm. So we got angiovac in. I got it in to be an adjunct to the PE program for right heart thrombus. And the first, I think, seven cases that we did were for tricuspid endocarditis because, wow. you know, because of that collaboration that when we got in service, it was me and the, my cardiothoracic surgeon side by side being in service, and we found this out. And so that's kind of how it morphed into. So now whenever we get a consult, whether it be myself or it be him, we get together, we do a multidisciplinary uh, uh, evaluation, and it's kind of also morphed into the, the pacemaker and device lead explantation uh, team who are made up of thoracic surgeons who've now, anytime we get a consult, whether it comes from echo, which usually goes through me, or if it comes uh, from an outside hospital, it goes through them, we call each other and we collaborate and we say, what's the best thing for the patient at this time? So that's kind of how everything morphed. And to be honest with you, I think it's been a, a great environment. So nobody's left kind of on an island by themselves saying yes or no to a patient. When, we, when somebody calls, when a patient calls, when a referring provider, referring hospital calls, they know they're getting an answer from a multidisciplinary team, not just from one provider saying yes or no. Right. That was very good. And, yes. and you took my question, but it brought up another Tammy question for me. Tammy took my question. Okay, so, so that's, how, that's how it works. There's no fighting it. There's no fighting so, You're reading my notes. Oh. <laughs> so so uh, uh, on your PERT team, you know, your PE or pulmonary embolus response team uh, program, um, I'm not really allowed to involve Mark in this, but I'm hopeful that, uh, you, you know, in deference to your time as well, we'll send you this por the next portion of the video, unless you just want to watch it live, which you're certainly welcome to do. But w if we have your email, we can we transfer or Dropbox or something, the video sure. of what we're going to do. But I think there is a big difference between, I think people need to differentiate between the chronic PE patient that's going to go in to, a, uh, to the operating room, be under profound hypothermia, circulatory arrest, and they're gonna go out and basically do, uh, do uh, 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 you know, removal of all of this chronic PE. They're almost like they're doing an endarterectomy on the pulmonary artery system to pull all of that out. And that's not what this is for. This is more for the, the, the acute pulmonary embolus patient, whether it be you know, one side or the other, or a saddle block embolus, or am I missing something? Uh, I see you look raising your eyebrows, so I'm not sure if, if we're if, if I'm saying something that you disagree with. No, I don't disagree, uh, except for the fact that I do have to say, since we brought it up with me here, uh, that it has not been tested within the Angiovac cannula hasn't been tested in its existing form by our company yeah. for utilization within the pulmonary vasculature and may be considered outside the scope. Sure, so fair I, enough. So yeah. I have to leave that there from my perspective, but. Uh, Dr. Zlotnick, if you would like to chime in on that, yeah, that's fair. Uh, I think that you can to a specific question. Well, I mean, I think the specific question he was asking was the difference between chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and acute PE, which are two different, obviously, entities and, Animals, and yeah. treated differently. I mean, I, there's just a very small uh, amount of programs around the, the world that can, I feel, do a, a good job of doing a chronic 
you know, pulmonary thrombectomy versus the acute case where you're going in and doing a pulmonary embolectomy in an acute PE. And again, those are two completely different physiologic states. One's acute RV, you know, dysfunction from RV strain versus one which is more of a kind of a chronic pulmonary hypertension picture. So, right. um, yeah. So, so with that said, and, and Mark, you can just ignore this, okay? You're not listening to this because I'm going, I'm going off, the, I'm going rogue uh-huh. on Mark. <laughs> so what I want to tell people in the audience is that, and I really want your opinion on this later, is I've come up with a system by which let's just hypothetically say you have a patient who is on the floor, um, is status post maybe uh, cabbage surgery or some other procedure that was done and uh, they're getting ready to be discharged home. They get up, start walking, and they drop to the floor, and it's, uh, they start resuscitative measures immediately, and it's suspected that this patient has had an acute pulmonary embolus, so they, uh, they don't know for sure, but there's something really bad going on, so they go ahead and initiate VA ECMO. So you get VA ECMO established, and you get mechanical circulatory support and, and, and pulmonary support on the patient, but now what are you going to do? You're going to take them to another room. And of course you could have another whole system available uh, to then do the angiovac procedure. But what I'm going to show everybody is an idea that I came up with, which may not be a great, I think it's a good idea, but I want people to actually help me appreciate whether this is just me being a little bit crazy or if it's really a good idea, but a single circuit system that can do both VA ECMO for the patient with the PE for mechanical circular support support, and then integrate into that same system, the angiovac catheter very easily and go in, retrieve the saddle block embolus or whatever side, whatever the, the, the acute PE is, and then go back to regular VA ECMO in a single circuit, which makes it faster and easier. But you have to consider that if you think it's a PE or suspect it, you have to have a separate pack that has this particular piece attached to it. And that's what I'm going to show the audience after we take a short break and do all that kind of stuff. And again, if you watch it live, great. If you don't, we're happy to send it to you via Dropbox. But I would like to get your opinion and also your perfusionist opinion on what they think of this idea. Um, I think it's a great idea. I think it really is gonna work very well. We're gonna test it and we're gonna test it live. So if I fail, it's gonna be horrible for me, but, uh, but I think it's gonna work out really well. And I'd just like to get everybody's opinion about what they think of it, except for Mark's. Thank mm-hmm. you. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, from my standpoint, it's actually been described of using, you know, splicing in VA ECMO for angiovac. Well, so, but you're splicing VA ECMO into the angiovac. That's a little different. I'm talking about putting a patient on VA ECMO and right. then not splicing in the angiovac, but it's already prepared with a certain side port, which I'll show you, which makes okay. it very easy to connect and then do the angiovac and then remove that portion yeah. of it and maintain your VA ECMO. Uh, it sounds interesting. Yeah, I would obviously like to see what it, what it goes through. To, to kind of just go through a couple of the points of this, uh, what you're describing. If you're going to put somebody on VA ECMO for a saddle pulmonary embolism, that's not a standalone treatment. That's basically a, an adjunct or a way of stabilizing the patient until definitive therapy. And this has been shown out in study after study, which is that definitive therapy to treating the pulmonary embolism needs to be performed, whether it be a surgical thrombectomy, whether it be IV thrombolytic therapy, or whether it be mechanical thrombectomy. So I think the right thing to do is early on, especially in a massive PE, stabilize the patient, whether it be hemodynamic support, but then you need to do definitive therapy to treat the pulmonary embolism. So mm-hmm. what you're saying is all true because I think the wrong decision that's made is put somebody on VA ECMO and then wait. You, you, you're not waiting for recovery. You've got to do something to kind of help, help that recovery. So in that regard, now whether what your adjunct therapy of definitive treatment, whether it's one of those that's kind of a dealer's choice to what your institutional expertise is, has. So. Okay, well, we'll find out. And like I said, I'd really like you to show it to your perfusionists and uh, ask them to send me an email or something, uh, giving me their opinion about it and also the rest of my colleagues. I'd like to hear input on that as we move this ball forward. Before you go, though, I got a question for you. And I asked Mark this question earlier. And I think Stephanie and Tammy both have the same question. I can look at a, a city like Houston. And we're a big city, 
we have a lot of people. We're the third largest city in the country at this point in time. And yet, the number of angiovac cases that we do here in this town and the general and the, and the metropolitan area as well, not just Houston proper, is significantly lower than what a place like Indianapolis does, which has a much smaller population accounting for the city and its geographical area. Why is that? Yeah, I mean, I think we, yeah, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head as far as, you know, the disparity in institutional practices around the country. And part of that's based on the hospitals, how the hospitals are uh, set up, who's doing what procedures. Is there institutional resources such that cardiothoracic surgery does the majority of these procedures and that that's been their historical and their outcomes have been good? Uh, looking at how many hospitals have the ability to even set up an angiovac program, what's the need in the in the in the uh, the community? Now, I would assume, but you know, I'm, that a, a city like Houston, that their IV drug use population is probably not that much smaller than Buffalo's, no so that the, probably not. the institution, you know, the community needs are there. So it's really kind of getting out there, educating clinicians of this device, the the use, and you know. You have to also take a look that there's a lot of clinicians and a lot of hospitals. Let me put it this way. There's a lot of hospitals where you have a lot of uh, clinicians doing a small amount of procedures instead of having, you know, places where you have one or two hospitals where you have a lot of a, a few physicians doing a lot of procedures. Mm -hmm. And so you have physicians who become much more confident with large bore access, closure techniques, working with perfusionists. So mm -hmm. Angiovac is one of those procedures to me where it takes an interventional skill set with a surgical mindset, right? Mm -hmm. And so you need people who, who kind of fit that bill to take on these programs. And that's where I think identifying physician champions, having a multidisciplinary program and collaboration, once that framework's put in place, we'll start to see that I think more and more people will be treated this way. And it's going to be imperative on people like myself to get our data out there to kind mm -hmm. of show that we can successfully treat these patients with this. We can take patients from, from surgery, treating them medically, having just as good outcomes and potentially not having the adverse outcomes later on of, of device, uh, prosthetic device uh, infection. That's gonna change practice, but it's not gonna happen overnight. So well, those reducing, are, I think, are kind of the barriers. Yeah, and reducing the risk of sternotomy. Well, I personally, and I think I speak on behalf of all of my colleagues, Tammy, Stephanie here at the table, but everybody else out there, doing these kinds of educational programs and i want to thank you so very much for taking so much of your time to do this because i truly believe that as a as a profession as an as a as a as a as a, a specialty within this realm perfusion can be the champion so to speak to get the word out there that this is a therapeutic modality that could really help a lot of patients and i think that the more people the more professionals in our arena that we get this word out to uh, is going to benefit everyone in particular and especially the patient at the end of the day, which is what we're all here to serve, you know, uh, uh, bar none. So, uh, so I want to thank you uh, very much from the bottom of my heart sure. for taking so much time out of your very busy schedule to, uh, to educate us and to give us some extremely valuable information. I also want to thank Mark because he did the exact same thing. He gave a tremendous overview on uh, the multitude of different uh, disease processes that can be addressed with the use of the angiovac catheter and uh, with the, with the uh, 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 essentially vacuuming of unwanted intravascular material, or removal of un unwanted intravascular material through the use of, of, of suction or vacuum or whatever you wanna call it. I can't think of a more fancy term to use. Vacuum it's the best I can do. So, you know, we can all be called the Hoovers of the perfusion world, I guess. Um, but, uh, or now I guess it's Shark now. They're the stronger. Dyson. Dyson is the best one. So we need to call you Dyson. But, uh, but right. with that said, one, thanks again. Thanks to you. Thanks to Mark. And I know, Mark, you can't be a part of my demonstration. But Dr. Zlotnick, we will send you the video via Dropbox, um, regardless of whether you watch it live or not. But if sure. you would, please say a prayer for me and wish me luck. All right. Well, good luck. Thank All right, you. everybody. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Z. Any other comments or questions before we take a short break and we get started with the demonstration? You'll never, this is live. I haven't tried it once before. <laughs>
So I'm going to try it for the first time. So if you want to have the opportunity to possibly see Joe take a giant leap off a cliff, <laughs> stay tuned. Any other comments before we take a short break? Nothing for me. Okay. How long do we need as a break in order to the minimum amount of time that we need? 10 minutes. Okay. 10 minute break. So be back in exactly 10 minutes. Mix cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mix dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy, and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the Easy Flow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova Easy Flow Duo Cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy Flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible, direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. Care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20-year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post-procedure, so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're gonna screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, this is how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 
So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we're about hospital-wide. I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500 and then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by perfusionists and for perfusionists. Create a free account and check us out today.
I'm ready. My mic, mic's on. Yeah, mic's on. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, so here is our demonstration. As you can see, that we're, you know, you can come. You can, I need your help. As you can see, this is our, wherever you want to be. Right here's fine. Um, we have our, 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 lovely, our lovely model, Stephanie. Um, we are here with our patient, and our patient is on VA ECMO. So this is the patient I was talking about. Before I get started, actually, I want to bring something up. And I think I misspoke earlier, is that for my perfusion colleagues out there, of which I have many, all right, um, and watching this show, this is really something that I see as um, different from what we're used to, perhaps, but so potentially beneficial to a patient. And I've seen it happen. I've done several of these cases. Stephanie, you've done a couple of cases with mm -hmm. me. Um, where we absolutely saved that patient from either a massive pulmonary embolus or certainly from a sternotomy and having to go on bypass to go into the heart and fish out that big thrombus, those mobile clots. And we've taken out some humongous clots. We've done a couple of programs on AngioVac now. And if you go on, I think, YouTube and type in AngioVac, you'll find most of our stuff. But I really think this is something that as a, as a, as a profession... Uh, perfusion needs to become more supportive, uh, more involved, maybe not go out and look for cases per se. I don't think that would necessarily be appropriate. And I don't think that would really necessarily be within our purview to do that. However, when in discussions with people where you may see a patient with tricuspid valve vegetation, or you may see an infected lead, or you may see a mobile thrombus, or you may see an occluded uh, uh, ilio IVC complex, at least be aware that this exists. And when somebody wants to do it, um, and it's not something you've done before, because Stephanie, you and I did your first case together, and you were not, you weren't too excited. I was not. But once you, no, in all seriousness, it's but, true. but when you did it, now you're quite comfortable with it. So right. I'll leave this to everybody out there. If you ever, yes. I can do it. Exactly. <laughs> Magic can do it. If you ever, if you want to do this and you're just uncomfortable, call me. I, I'll be happy to help you any way that I can. I'll come help. I'll come there with you. They have great technical support. I can tell you right now, their clinical support staff can talk you through anything. Because I had to do my first case too. And the clinical support team from Hedgeovac is absolutely one they of the are. best I've ever worked with. And they got me through it. Um, so but, Joe, are we going to open the phone lines anymore today? Yeah, if somebody open them up. But I, if anybody wants, yeah, you can open them up. But if anybody wants to come do this or wants to do this and just wants some additional support, another perfusionist, you can call me on the phone. You can ask me to come up. I'll do anything I can to help because it's all about taking care of the patient. That's what we're all here for. So this patient collapsed on the floor, suspected PE, the PERT team was called and they put the patient immediately on VA ECMO, but they put them on VA ECMO with my ECMO circuit. So this is the PERT team ECMO circuit that I've designed. Um, and here's, let me go take you through it. So we're cannulated fem fem, femoral venous, femoral arterial, as you can see here. You have the in, inflow coming through here, going into the centrifugal cone. It's going into the oxygenator. Oxygen's connected, of course, to the source. Arterialized blood is now coming out. We have our flow probe. You can see our flow is five liters, and it's going back into the femoral artery. So on echo, they still see that the right ventricle is still dilated, though it is better compressed than it was prior to the ECMO. Uh, but there's clearly, they see something in the pulmonary artery. So now we're gonna do an angiovac to remove this uh, obstruction, this saddle block embolus. So I'm gonna bring it over, show you how it's designed, but this is our venous. And for the PERT team, this would be the extra line that would already be built into the pack. And if you look right here, this is actually a plugged line. So this won't, won't come out, uh, nothing will happen if I take off this clamp. 
There is some air in it right now, so I'm not going to take it off to make sure I don't suck in any air to the system, but I have a clamp on it as well, but it is a plugged line, okay? And you can have these. These are manufactured by multiple people. You can get and create this on your own. So I'll set this down for now. So that's the sidearm that's extra in a standard ECMO circuit, but with the sidearm for performing the angiovac procedure. So I'm gonna come over here and get our device, and I'm not gonna go through the entire process. Now, where's a good spot for this, guys? Tell me where I need to put it. Is this a good spot? No, go back towards the... Um, go back towards here? Yeah, right there. Yep. Right here? Okay. Okay, so I've already attached everything to it and it's not necessarily how it would actually look, but just for the for time, this is going to be our angiovac and I'll hand this to Professor Stephanie. All right. And that's what's going to go into the right IJ. So we're fem fem here, the approach we're going to use is right IJ. And the reason why is because now that they have this Gen 3, you can see that we're going to be able to make this turn to get through the tricuspid valve and up into the past the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary artery. So you have that. You might want to make that straight because we have to prime I it. Had it straight. Okay. All right. Then this piece here is our access. And how this works is very simple. You take your protective cap off. You remove this plug I referred to. You connect this to it. And now you have an angiovac connected directly to your ECMO uh, circuit. Now we have to prime it. So we have a pressure bag with a liter of saline. And what I'm going to do is open this stopcock. I'm going to take another clamp and I'm going to clamp. Let's see. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to go up through here and then to you. So that's how we're going to do it. So I'm going to first... I'm going to clamp this, Makes sense. open this up, and I'm going to let this fill and try to get as much of the air out as you can. And thank you. Okay. Okay. And then I'll clamp that when we get that little meniscus right here. All right. Nice. So now I'm going to flush this towards Stephanie mm -hmm. and she's going to let it just prime into the bucket and hold it up to allow for air to be evacuated. They would do this at the field. And it's under pressure, so it's gonna squirt. No, so come way? on. <laughs> and there you go. And we'll tap the line a little bit. I'm actually shocked how fast and easy. And there, that's primed. And we're happy. Now we also have to prime that, that thing yeah, there, the but syringe? we're not gonna prime it. For, will it suck okay. the air through? It will not. It won't, okay. so don't worry about okay. it. We're not going to do we that, but we'll, we'll pretend like we did. You put a syringe on there with saline, squirt it, and it goes through, and then okay. you can get the outer sleeve primed as well. But just, again, for deference of time. No problem. Okay, so I was wondering, um, now you're, not, you're comfortable maneuvering that thing? Yeah. Okay, well, so. Well, I'm going to try. Yeah, but we're not going after that one. <laughs> okay. What I have in here mm. is FLARP, it's a and lot. this FLARP, is going to represent somewhere in the neighborhood, take a look at that right there, yeah, it's definitely more of than two centimeters. about a 10 centimeter long iliac thrombus that ended up going up, breaking off from the iliac, going up, getting into the RV and out into the PA, and now you've got it blocked, okay? Right. So I'm going to attach <clears throat> this to here, like <clears throat> this, okay? And get my little towel now you have uh, you have that primed up real good you didn't take it out and is it is it unprimed because I could prime it a little just more prime it a little let me prime it a little more just to, sure. just to be sure mm -hmm. yep yep got the air out Air's out. okay I'll clamp that now all right so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have Stephanie bring it over here pretend mm -hmm. like you're going into the right IJ like right. this and as you come down Go ahead all the way back. Okay. All the way back. There you the go. Air, You're gonna, that's okay. okay. Come down like this and guide it with your hand like this. You just take it. You're gonna have to do it with two hands. All right, I need a and I'm gonna system. manage the pump, okay? So she's through the tricuspid valve. And now what we're gonna do is, and you watch the flow here, so don't engage anything yet, okay? All right. Yes. No, let me go on the other side. Let me get on the other side, forgive me. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to switch our clamp. We're going to go from our current femoral cannula that we're on VA ECMO with, and I'm going to switch to the angiovac catheter for ECMO. And you can see the flow dropped a little bit. I'll turn the RPMs up a little teeny bit. We'll get to four liters. And I think that's good. You can see the swirling right here. So we have a good situation where we're still on mechanical circulatory support. The patient's still being oxygenated. Now what's, what, what uh, uh, Stephanie is gonna do is she's gonna advance that catheter into the pulmonary artery. And when she captures, wait, mm -hmm. when she captures that clot, I'm gonna see this flow go to zero. Now, that's a problem. And it's a problem why? Oh, what's going on? I'm just telling Matt where he needs to have the camera. You know, oh, you need to move the camera up. You can't see it. Pull it back or go up on it. So we can see the filter in the line. You don't see this, Magic, right here. Oh, yeah, the higher. Magic, you need to see this right here. Magic. On the other camera. Oh, I'm confused. What camera are we looking at? So I know we're doing this right. But I want to see this. Okay. Can you we'll please go back up back. on it so that I can see this? We'll Thank you. All right. That's what I want to see is that. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Now, with that said, you're going to see the flow go to zero. She's going to say engaged. I'm going to say engaged. The clock is going to start because we're not going to have any more flow for a brief period of time, right? And make so, sure you tell them that's not, do not turn the flow down when that right. happens. Whatever you do, that's what you want to have happen. But again, the patient will be at, without circulation. The clock starts. Now, I'm going to tell you another recommendation. If you ever were to put a patient that was arrested on VA ECMO, what is the first thing we're going to do? You're going to cool them down to 34, 35 degrees. That's going to buy you more time. Any arrest, any any arrest protocol, hypothermia protocol, secondary to arrest, is going to have as its first component hypothermia. So you're going to cool the patient down to 34 degrees. That's my recommendation. That's going to buy you more time for when you do this, because at this point, this could all be done a whole lot faster than I've been explaining it. Okay, if it wasn't for me sitting here talking, we'd have done been done with this case, and the patient would probably have normal circulation restored as it was. But we have to explain everything if we can. You might want to prime it a little higher. See? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, I'm sucking air. Yeah. Okay, hold on. Let me turn it down. Here, open that clamp if for me getting... down there. Squeeze, just squeeze the bag. Wait, off. wait, 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 wait. Come Don't. off for a second. Yeah, come off. Now just squeeze it. Just squeeze hard. No. Squeeze. No, no. Come off here for a second. And squeeze. How do I get it? Into oh, here, I have to open this. Yeah, so clamp that. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. Keep squeezing. Here. If she's pulling, if she's getting a little bit of air good. in, it's okay. probably because of the back. All right, go back on. Let me go back on. It's not tightened down around the cannula. Okay. And so it may be pulling some in. I think it, I think it was pulling a little. That's fine. Tighten tighten the okay, so you're yeah. around the outer cannula. What I have to do. And it'll stop pulling air. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Okay. okay, so we're back in business, all right? So we're on VA ECMO. Let's go ahead and start advancing. And remember, don't put your hand down in the water. So you well, put it, do it like you're in, 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 okay. in, in, in real, like from a more acute angle. There you go, like that. Er, you go, go up and get it. Go up oh. and get the whole thing. Get it. Get it. Get it. You Keep know going. what? That's got the toothpick on it, so it's not going to go. It's got that toothpick, see? Yeah, the toothpick. Here, take some, take some bend out of it, please. Mm -hmm. Take some bend out of the catheter. Pull yeah. back. Pull you'll back. Have, you'll have to loosen the blue tui. Pull back. Just a little I don't bit. Think that's yes. a Pull back. You stretch the crap out of the canyon. Keep going. Pull back. Pull back. I am. There. Oh, what about don't stick your hand in there? I had to. <laughs> <laughs> I ad lib. <laughs> there it is. Okay. There it is. In real life, it probably worked. I had a toothpick holding it holding in. Holding that. In. So yeah. there was a little bit of a problem, and I also think the other problem was that there was so much of a bend that we were coming up to the glass mm, and not yeah. there was too much of a bend. So what would have helped is to have put it here and pulled straight up with it mm -hmm. and that might have done it. But we can do it again because that's the beauty of 
flarp. We could just do it again. So let's do another one. Why don't you go okay. after that stuff? Okay. Now let's watch it. Oh, we started the clock, 40 seconds. Yeah, I'll take some how, more flarp. And did we actually, how low flow did we get to or did it stay full the whole time? I don't know. I didn't have enough in it there. Never it never went to zero. No. Okay. okay, so let's do another one. Okay. Go in there and get it. Oh, that was fast. Look at that. And we're still on the key here is, and this is a lot. It's a lot. This isn't, this is, you, a clot that big would be enormous. Yeah. But we didn't clock. even have to start the clock. Eight seconds and 38 seconds from engagement. And it only went down to 2.4. And it only 2. went down 4. to 2.4. And that they can see that all on the video. So we're going to do one more, only this time I'm going to be more generous. Oh, my. I told him to start with less amount just in case it didn't work. This time, I want you all to see this. <laughs> that is, That's a lot of clock. Yes, okay. I will roll it like it's an iliac. <laughs> right. And this Roll time, it. what you're going to do yes. is come stand like this. And when you, when you make that bend, yep. make the full bend, come up with it. Make the full bend like first. Here. Stick it all the way out. Go ahead and stick it all the way out. No, stick the whole mean? thing all the way out. Go all the way in. Advance it all the way. Oh, wait. See, I have to lock it so that we don't get the air. Yeah. So. Push it. Okay. No, all the way out. All right. All the way now. Yeah, all the way out. Okay. There. Keep going. There you go. All right. And this time, come it. up with it like this. Okay. Don't go, don't go at such an angle. Try to come straight up. We'll just try it and see. All right. Okay. You know, it would have been a lot more fun if you, like, had fish in here. <laughs> <laughs> <That's mean. laughs> okay. Okay, guys, I need a piece of tape. Our original undesirable material was yes. fishing lures. It was fish farming. Oh, wow. Yep. That's what we used to use to pull out. That makes sense. That makes, it does make sense. Gummy it's, worms. It's, uh, yeah, gummy, we did use gummy for lures. Well, but the, but while he's doing this, yes. I just want to say I'm really impressed with your company that they made so many changes to the catheter and it shows that you really have an interest in advancing in this and really going somewhere with it. To, Thank you very to much. To recognize what people need to make it successful. This flarp so is falling it's, apart. It's a good point. Um, one of the things that we did after we got our, even for going from one to two, which there. just had some minor iterative, iterative I'm getting changes, even more flarp, bigger. We did it even by bigger. gaining feedback from the field. And then mm -hmm. when we got ready to do this three. Is, this is ridiculous. This is a ridiculous piece of flarp. When we got ready to do three, we actually got, uh, we found that some of the people in the field were already sh heat shaping our cannulas, which is outside oh, the scope right. of the indication, uh -huh. big time. Uh, but, but we engaged with them to be able to find out exactly what angles, why, where. Uh -huh. um, a lot of thought went into making sure that we did this. And I'm excited to say that we're, we're approaching um, some of our first milestones early for our fourth generation devices, again, used to where we'll test them and study them inside the pulmonary vasculature. Great. It's going to be fun. I guess. Hardy R &D. <laughs> we did. We I did. We had, we had some field R&D out there, man. The thing I'm interested in for all the people watching Here, can you is cut this for me? After watching this program, if you would be oh, more just cut it right inclined there. to yeah. try AngioVac now that you've heard the talks and seen this in action and what you think about it so right on even if you call in tomorrow if we don't have an opportunity today i'm really okay. curious okay uh, this is a from massive my standpoint, if i could ask i'd love to know this, what barriers they see look at this barriers. did you look at this this is a massive <laughs> amount of clot that's crazy so, <laughs> i don't think this <laughs> that is, is that is a lot i don't of think clot. this is coming out but we're going to we'll find try, out but so yeah, if we open the phone lines, those are, I think, the questions we have, right? Yeah. What are the barriers to keep you from attempting this? And if you, okay, if there was anything that made you more likely today to want to try it. Okay, you ready? Now, I can tell you, I can tell I'm you ready. what you're, I'm, I'm going to give you, a, I'm going to set this up if I can, it's fine, Joe. It's fine, it's fine. Yeah, just can I set it. this up real quick? Yes. yes. So what you're going to see whenever you get to a piece that's this large mm -hmm. is that it is going to take a little while to be able to pull it into the inner di diameter of the cannula. We want uh -huh. that to happen. Yeah, the second thing it. that's going to happen is, is that FLARP does something a clot doesn't do. So the FLARP will actually, once it engages, it'll actually wrap around the outside of the funnel, mm. which will help to prevent a little bit of this. I'll show you a trick that we use in just a couple of moments, but I want you to be the one to engage it so say, you can you get started. Do okay. Nope. okay. I'm just you gonna get my finger there, okay? Okay. To hold it up. Okay. Let's this is an enormous clot. This should not happen. Get ready for the clot clock. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Clot clock. Okay. Clot clock. Go. You getting it? 
You might as well bump the flow rate up a little bit. No, don't start the clot. We're not ready. <laughs> we will. You got to go up and get it. Oh, can I have four and a half liters of flow? Starting. I'm waiting. You're waiting can on I have, me? Yes. Can I have four okay, and a half? Okay. Can I have four and a half liters of flow for oh, you? Oh, you got my finger. Go get it. Okay, start the clock. Okay, let's let's turn this up. Okay, the clock is going. Just okay, leave it. You leave be it. Down to leave it. Just stick it back in the glass, though. Okay. Just leave it. We're down to zero flow. Zero flow. And right. we're just gonna wait. Can I? Fall? Yes. I don't think you'd come on. Come. Nope. Just leave it. Nope. Just just come on. Come help him. Come so help he her. Just watch. Just keep the clock going. He has a Mark, go ahead. Help. Him. Yeah. Uh, do so it. this is an important point, right? So yeah. getting getting to zero flow. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, that people want to do oftentimes is they want to take the cannula, they, uh, they want to take the pump and turn it off because they're at zero flow. Bad That's idea. Right, it's don't the do that. opposite Terrible. of what we want to do. So at this point, what needs, what should happen is, is that the physician who's doing this should take an image and be able to determine whether or not we are engaged in material or whether or not it's sitting like a golf ball on a tee. Uh -huh. If it's like a snow cone or golf ball on a tee, you can do that by simply placing a little bit of a multi-purpose cannula down through the side port, shooting a little dye in, and then seeing whether or not you're engaged. If it's not engaged inside of there, then instead of uh, instead of clamping it, if you clamp it, you can actually get a little piece, of, a little bit of forward pressure into there, release it, and then you're going to end up you freed it from its spot of origination. Mm -hmm. That now you're going to have to chase it out of the atrium. Okay. So we want to stay on, mm -hmm. and during our pre-case plan, we've determined the size, the shape, the mobility, the density, and we've talked about whether or not there could be a need for a cut down Ooh. in this space. That's this cheap Delphin pump. Don't ever use it. <laughs> oh. It's here because it's out of. Uh, it's out of. Yeah, it doesn't exist anymore. Now. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so end of, end of life. life. So, don't worry so, about so what we're going to do? Let's let's assume. And if I could borrow this with you. Yes. Please let's pull down out of the glass. Let's assume that we have uh, we have we have proven that we're actually engaged. Yeah. See it wrapped in the around material. it, just like you showed. But see yes. what we're talking about here yes. on the back yes. end. Yes. Uh, we'll get it right there. See how it wraps around the end. So we have this that we can actually do. And if you'll keep us in frame, I'll show you. Can you hold that right there? Mm -hmm. So That's what we're right. going to do okay. is we're going to loosen the, the TUI on the back end. And we're going to retract oh, the cannula wow. in just a little bit, uh -huh. just enough. And if you can turn it so that they can see the tines of the funnel right there. A little bit more, the other a little way. more, other way. There you go. There you go, right there. there. Okay. So if I back this in just now, just a little bit, if I back that in just a touch, See how it grabs a hold of it, yes. ref reforms it, and then gives me a chance to go back in? I see. See where we, we just pulled the piece out. in? Yeah, some is coming. No, oh, it just now, lost it. No, no, it's okay. Uh, it's okay. I wanted to show this. I did this on purpose. That's okay. okay. I'm glad okay. it worked. Okay. I'm glad so, it worked. No, no, I'm, I'm glad that this happened because what you want to be able to see, go ahead and come down on the flow just a little bit. Yes. So we, we have talk, managed to fill the patient full of air. We talked. We talked a little bit. This about is a ridiculous example, by the way, because you'd never see a clot that, that big. This would have no, never happened. It's, it's showing a lot, though. Well, and it's showing. It's showing again what the limitations of the simulated clot are with this, but also, if we can come back on flow just a little bit. Yes. I have to that. Nah, we're all right. So for my purposes, we are. We're not in the PA. We're in the IBC. All right, we're flowing pretty good. Yeah. Now we've got a hold of this material. Now we're going to get it to where you can see it again. Now, we don't, we're not going to find something this large. If you think about the standard size of a right atrium as an example, it's about four to four and a half centimeters uh, in volume. Oh you're, you're not going to see material like this and still have, a, still have a, uh, a scenario that's really conducive to continuing to live. <laughs> yes. So yes. we're going to, but we can, but we can massage this but and that's... help the angiovac. See where we're doing just kind of like a Pac-Man kind of maneuver? Yeah, that really so in the in an event where you're going to have and a, we're deep primed over here, so yeah. but we got a lot. Look, even more came out. It just came out. I mean, of our material. filter is occluded. Our our we're sucking air all a over lot the place. Of that is because um, we're not primed within this. Ah, so yes. We keep pulling the air. In I got yes. the air coming out of the back of this, but yeah. you can see now that we're flowing again, and we had a secondary yes. IBC yes. filter in that I can go through. And this and stuff has all been all caught that. in the filter. There you go. And then we're able to go through and clean so up all long, the rest of that material. How long were we without? Well, we we, we went over obviously, yeah. but but the first I think the first example was, was a more much more realistic example. Okay. It was a very short period of time. And the whole you're... look at this, the filter is completely clogged. Look, your patient mm -hmm. is so much better. You can now dis discontinue everything and send the patient home as planned. <laughs> 
Yes, and we can right. switch back to VA ECMO. Yeah, so air free. Turn it back so we can run it back on. Now air free, except for our cone and our oxygenator. But other than that, it was perfect. <laughs> other than these little mishaps, this was perfect. Mark, great job on explaining that. Thank, yes, you. thank you. We thank like you. that that, that you can pull that back. And I think that was just way too big. It was very really I I I I, I sabotaged myself, <laughs> you did. but that's okay because there were a lot of good lessons learned from it. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Well, with all of that said, is there anything anybody else wants to say or contribute or add or anything before we say goodbye? No. Oh, we got a case later. We have a case this afternoon, later this afternoon. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's it it's it it's loopy tortilla uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an angio back and well you guys are going to loopy tortilla i'm going to true lux tammy uh. stephanie because you know have you ever cracked open one of those king crab legs and you see that oh, big so it, it looks exactly like what an angio back would want to remove okay did we, did we both bet this or just me no it was both of you <laughs> both we can split it but yeah you split it i wouldn't want you both to take i would want yeah at one time i asked my question though what was the question no, i asked my question you said everybody had a question what's that your was question you? it was me that was him. Oh, that was him. So right? Yes, you get to go. You You're my guest. Go. Yes. Okay, so we're back on VA ECMO. Patient's great. We'll see you tomorrow for the microvascular scan. Wait till you see these scans I got. And we got lucky because we did a heart. You get to see what it looks like when you go on bypass, which is incredible. You get to see what happens when you go from continuous to pulsatile flow. But then while we were doing all of that, we got an ECMO patient on top of it who was in severe, I mean, severe hypoxic crisis. And the microcirculation was unbelievably compromised. It was so incredible to see. And then when they got him on ECMO, the post, even though not normal, was significantly improved. But I've got all those images for you tomorrow and Dr. Uh, Keshen Mathura from uh, Amsterdam is gonna be Skyping wow. in and giving that uh, his presentation on how you can have a synchrony between the macro and micro circulation followed by all of these videos that we're gonna analyze. And we will see you tomorrow at approximately 12.45. 12.45. See you then, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you for allowing us to entertain you and uh, let us know what your thoughts are, please, especially for Dr. Uh, Zlotnick, for Mark Tatum, uh, Stephanie, Tammy, and myself. Any questions or comments that you want to make, you know we're always open. Please send them. Thank you all. Good. See you tomorrow. Good night. The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post-procedure, so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're gonna screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, this is how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. 
So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we are about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Mixed cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mixed dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy, and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the EasyFlow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova EasyFlow Duo cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500 and then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by perfusionists and for perfusionists. Create a free account and check us out today.